I'll save you guys from getting super dizzy. Hello, everybody. My name's Aaron Ciotti. Everybody calls me Ciotti. And I still need a haircut. Really, really bad. I'm starting to look like a total moron. But it's winter. Let your hair grow. Let your beard grow. I don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody, let's get this knocked out. Wanna Get Fly is here. Thomas, Wanna Get Fly was the first one here. Uh, shout out there. Thomas Bird. Thomas, how's the, uh, did you get the frame from Brad yet? I'm interested. Uh, Supercell, Hex, Spudnik, Budget FPV, Jesse T, Proton to Go, Mars FPV Drones, David Noose, FPV Tips, Night Train, F Night Train FPV, Shane Duggar in the house, Mars FPV again, Great Golden Spoon, Wanna Get Fly, KTMJ, FPV Tips again, uh, who else do we have here? Daryl Hickman, oh, come on, chat, don't do the thing. <sighs> it does it, it does it every time, and I lose my place every time. Uh, well, I'm just gonna guess. Wanna get fly? KTMJ, Spudnik, Daryl Hickman, wanna get fly again? Tiago Ramos, Jason Peters, Proton to go, Jason Peters, rather. Uh, Shane again, wanna get fly again? David Noose again, Doc Murdoch, Cement Kid, Ben Watkins, IMAX, Sharp Pizza FPV, <laughs> Sharp? Sharp Pizza FPV. Very interesting name. What's the uh, story behind that, Sharp? <laughs> uh, Sean Hales, Daniel Tapanier, Jim Golden, Jacob Swearington, swearing in, 
<laughs> I've, I've said that wrong twice in a row. I'll get it eventually. Kenneth Daly, Cement Kid again, Mexi FPV, GW FPV. I see you guys trying to get in to get your name read. Get it, get it, get it. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Sterling Youngman, Miha, Miha Hulk, uh, OCD FPV. That's a good name right there. OCD FPV. Me and you, brother. Kaleo FPD, William Barlow, and Alien Cowboy FPV. What's up, everybody? Um, before I forget, speaking of OCD FPV, um, I made a new... Uh, a couple people asked me to um, make a... All right, let me back up. So I have clinical depression and um, generalized anxiety disorder and a little bit of OCD thrown in. And I try really hard to be very, very outspoken about that and just talk about it because there's a horrible stigma of not talking about it. Um, and the only way that we're going to break that is to talk about it. So I try my best to be as vocal as I can within reason. Um, in the FPV community, a lot of us have something going on there. Um, just by nature, the, the adrenaline dump that we get from FPV... Um, and the fact that it's a hobby that's so big and there's so many things to do, I think that really fits well with somebody that um, has mental illness issues. So a couple of people had asked me, you know, again, I, I try to be outspoken about it. I'd posted and uh, I posted something or other. I don't even remember what it was last week. Um, and a couple of people asked me to, I, I made a joke and I said, yeah, we should make a support group here on Facebook. And a couple of people were like, yeah, please do it. So I did. Uh, and it is called... Let me actually pull it up. Uh, the name is not finalized yet, but I think it's going to end up being this. The first name I had was um, FPV Depressives, but that kind of, you know, depression is only one third of the, of the triangle of doom and <laughs> mental illness. Uh, so I ended up changing it to FPV Therapy, and that's where it's at right now. Um, so yeah, jump on over. It might be hard to find, so here's the link. Um, if you deal with mental illness or if some, a loved one deals with it or a friend or somebody you fly with, um, jump in there. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, a lot of people use the word depressed in, in exchange for the word sad, um, and it's something totally different. Uh, so yeah. Jump in there. You'll learn a lot. A uh, bunch of really cool people. I see you guys asking to join already. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna approve the the memberships because I'll be doing it this whole time. But at the end of the stream, I'll jump in and approve all you guys. Uh, but yeah. So jump over there, learn something, and you might even have it and not know it. So yeah. Uh, housekeeping stuff. Ciadi FPV on Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube. Uh, click the things here to do the things. Uh, the bell is supposedly kind of cool because you'll get an email and or a notification on your phone when I go live. Um, I do go live at random uh, during the week when I'm doing like editing or, or fixing something. So yeah, that's a, a good thing to do from what I've been told. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Patreon. Uh, CID FPV on Patreon. Here comes the link. And... I will actually pull it up as well. Oh, the link's in the description as well. Let us uh, let me pull it up real quick on the other monitor. So here's my Patreon. Um, so we're doing something new. We're doing, uh, so the first tier is $3. That gets you in the door uh, and lets you see all the stuff that I've posted in here. I've been just dumping info into this for the last couple of months. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff here. You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Um, I've got write-ups on RPM filtering, reducing the filtering uh, in the proper order, uh, just all kinds of fun stuff. And lately, we've been doing these giveaways. On, um, on Black Friday, there were a couple sites that did deals that were too good to pass up. And when I was ordering myself some stuff, I kind of realized... You know, these are cheap enough where I could probably buy a bunch of stuff here and then do giveaways and at least break even. Um, and thus far, I, I've just barely broken even and I'm totally cool with that. Uh, that was kind of the point. You guys give me a lot in support, a um, couple bucks here and there, and I just really appreciate that. It does mean a lot to me. 
And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to give back. That's the point here. What I did is I switched up the tiers. So previously I had it set up just like Joshua, where if you think my content's worth five bucks, great. If you think it's worth 10 bucks, even better. 20 bucks, even better, better, better. Um, but <laughs> what I did here is I moved the tiers around. The $5 tier is going to be a uh, Tiny Whoop giveaway, uh, items, Tiny Whoop related items. $10 tier is micro brushless related items. And then the $20 tier is the, is mini quad related items. Here's the deal though. Um, those of you folks that are in the EU, the shipping is nuts. Um, I tried to ship an XM plus and it was going to be like $17 and the XM plus is only worth like $19. So I ended up not shipping that. Um, so I would say if any of you guys in the EU want to get in on this, one of two things, either do the tiny whoop tier or don't do the tiny whoop tier because that stuff, um, that stuff is, I can almost guarantee the shipping is going to be worth, is going to be more than the item. Um, micro brushless tier, some of the stuff will be worth it. And then the, the mini, the mini quad tier should be worth it. But here's the deal. You guys got to cover the, the extra shipping. I'm willing to cover like five bucks in shipping. That's kind of what the typical shipping is in stateside. Um, beyond the five bucks though, I'm going to bug you to, to shoot me a Patreon just so that I don't, because like I said, I'm, I'm just barely kind of breaking even on this. I don't want to go into the red uh, because I don't make very good money, <laughs> quite frankly. But uh, yeah, so that's the deal. If you want to get on it, we do the uh, we do the drawings every Monday night. The reason why I'm doing it on Patreon is because I don't want to force you guys to be on the Monday night stream to get in on the giveaways. So the fact that I do it in Patreon, you know, you can jump in there, whatever tier you want, and I will pull all the names out before I do the roll and uh, before we spin the wheel, and then I'll contact you guys through through Patreon. So, yeah, it's been super fun. We've done it the past couple of Monday nights. Um, I, I just wanted to do it stateside for the past couple of Mondays to get the feel for it, and I wanted to go to the post office and see what it would cost to, to ship something overseas and, uh, yeah, I still can't believe how much it was, but yeah, if, if there's some stuff that's like 60, 70, $80. So those of you in the EU, yeah, it might be worth it for you. Um, if it's another XM plus, I'm, uh, we'll figure something out. It won't be another XM plus, but if it's something that's less than, um, the value of the item, like I said, we'll figure something out. So. That's out of the way, sold some insurance, Patreon's awesome, um, just in general, guys, like, get on Patreon, it, it, you're, you're supporting other people, and that's huge, um, you're gonna support somebody that, alright, so I'll use myself for example, I've got a lot of testing on here, I've got, one of the more recent posts I put up is this right here, Ciotti's hot all up weight battery motor prop combos, this is info that's taken me over two years to develop. Um, so for three bucks a month, you can go in here and find out, okay, I've got a 180 gram rig that's going to run best on 4S, 1304 motors, 5,000 5, KV and two and a half inch Emacs Avon blur props. Something like that, that can save you a couple hundred dollars. I, I, I'm probably in the thousands of dollars, like just researching shit and getting bad parts and throwing them away and destroying them and that the parts falling apart and ESCs failing here. Let me give you a... I, haven't I can't believe I haven't showed this yet on the stream, but to give you guys some idea of some of that testing, these are all blown up 20 by 20 and 30 by 30 ESCs, flight controllers, uh, and there's a couple run cam uh, HD boards in here. So yeah, imagine how much money is just in this, and there's there this isn't all of them. I have a bunch on the floor still waiting to be ho hooked up on this. This is gonna be a this is gonna be a little necklace for for IO or for Rampage. Um, but yeah, a lot of testing to find what sucks and what doesn't. And I would love for you guys to benefit from that. Um, so there you go. What else do we have? I think that's it. I think we're good. So, oh God, okay. Let me put this back up. Well, put it here. That should be better. That shouldn't blow out the camera too bad. Um, today's shirt is True RC, which matches my True RC mug. Thank you, True RC, for sending the awesome stuff. Um, I did an order with them for a couple of their new 
Singularity antennas, which have become hands down my favorite antennas to run uh, because they work unbelievably well and they're extremely lightweight and they're extremely durable. If you just do one thing, you got to do one thing to make them durable. And I'm getting the Logitech stuff up here so I can change the focus and show you guys. Okay, so when they come, they look like this. And if you guys don't know who True RC is, they're the OEM that makes uh, the Luminaire Axie antennas. So if you've ever had an Axie antenna, you've had a True RC antenna. Um, so this is how they come here. And one of the problems I have with a lot of these is when I slam really hard, the top cap will pop off. And that's not the end of the world because all the gubbins that are actually doing stuff are, are running around the outside. Do I have one? Yeah, okay, here you go. So here's what happens when they totally blow up. But that shows you what is actually in there. It's just basically like a, so there's two PCBs and then see that orangish yellow stuff? That's, you see how it's, it's got the diagonal line in it? That's what's doing the actual circular polarization. So on this one here, it broke half the way down, um, which is bad, and then it ripped the other side of this off. So th this is actually ruined. Um, but with these guys, like I said, the, the top cap will just pop off and it just looks ugly. The solution is very, very simple. You take a little piece of shrink wrap and just shrink wrap it right over there. So now the shrink wrap is grabbing the sides of the antenna or the sides of the, uh, the head on the, the CP antenna and it'll prevent the top from popping off. Um, I go one step further because I've had a bunch of these fail, not these specific ones, I've had a bunch of the foxier ones um, fail right here at the joint. So I go a step further and I put another little piece of shrink wrap on that joint. Um, so technically it's gaining a little bit of weight, but well, well, well worth it uh, to have the lightest, smallest, uh, toughest antenna. To, to be honest, the, the lightweight is what I really like about these because I run on my 5-inch rigs these, just like this. Um, direct uh, UFL plugged into the uh, uh, to the Tramp VTX, and then I do like a little 90 out the back, and then I run it at a 45 degree angle out the back of the rig. And the lighter these are, so these being the lightest, when it slams, there's not enough weight to really make it bounce over into the props. The the OG ones like like this, the, the old school bigger ones, they're heavy enough where they'll bend this UFL and get into the props and, and get all tangled up and angry. Um, so yeah, these being so lightweight and so small has led to them being super, super, super durable. And yeah, if you prefer Lumineer, you can get the Lumineer versions of these by getting their new Axie. Uh, oh, speaking of Lumineer and GetFPV, I am an affiliate over there nowadays uh, as of recently. So if you're doing a big GetFPV order, uh, down below in my description, there are some bit.ly links, which are the links that begin with bit.ly. Uh, those links are affiliate links to GetFPV. doesn't cost you anything and makes me a couple bucks so I can buy more stuff to test. So there you go. I'm also an affiliate on Banggood. There's some of those links down there and Amazon. Um, on With Amazon, if you're doing any kind of an Amazon order, if you hit one of my affiliate links, it puts my info in your cookies. And then if you do a big order, I'll get 1% or 2%, whatever the hell it is. Um, and again, I'm pouring all this, all, everything that comes in through Patreon, it's all going to my PayPal, and that's my Mad Money account. So it's literally going directly into just buying more stuff to to test out and and screw around with and give away sometimes. So there you guys go. Um, what are we doing first? Let's hit the chat. Let me make sure I didn't miss. Oh, I see a super chat. Let me go up a little bit and make sure I didn't miss a whole bunch of questions. Um, Oh, Supercell was asking about the, uh, okay, so I've been recommending the Talon F7 uh, MPU 6000 for a long time, and I've forgotten to tell you guys about the annoying little thing that you have to do. So if you pull up the product page on Heli Nation, Heli Nation is who makes all of the Talon stuff. So if you pull up the, the, the F7 V2 MPU 6000, just like I just did, 
Um, and all I did was a Google search for Talon F7 MPU 6000. Um, Heli Nation comes up first, go to the product page here, scroll down, and what's going to happen if you don't do this is Motor 4 is not going to spin up. Um, and Supercell just reminded me of this the other day, so I, I wanted to make sure I told everybody. You come in here and just read. Th this is really good info, um, so just read through this description um, because there's there's good info on like w which UART makes the most sense to put different things on. Um, so yeah, just read through it. But then the important bit is right down here, and you can see right here. To get motor to four, motor four to work, please use the CLI command below using Betaflight 404. Custom hex is soon coming three three four zero four. Um, I think I'm pretty sure you still have to use this in uh, 4.1. So yeah, when you hook it up, if your motor four is not spinning, this is what you have to dump into the CLI to get that working. Um, the reason the reasoning behind this is something related to the real pit, the the real pit mode for racers. Um, this fixes it, so I haven't really dove into it too much, but. Um, it kind of talks about it here, VTX pit. Um, I, I don't know the full deal because it just doesn't matter for me. Uh, so yeah, there you go. And then of course they've got the, uh, the 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 diagrams and the layouts, and this is really good too. This is actually what I use to build it, um, just because again it's got the main features on the left here that have the hints and tips and tricks as to you know hook this up here, hook that up there, blah blah blah, yada yada yada. There you go. All uh, right, so there we go with that. Let's see if I missed anything. No, I think I'm good. Comments, let's see what else we got. Uh, oh yeah, so a couple of you guys were uh, commenting on how snappy uh, that raw uh, flight was. That was like a half an hour ago, right down the street here. That is due to uh, the RPM filter is doing such a good job at crushing all the noise and all the vibes that are getting into the gyro that you can now just go ballistic with your PID tune. Someone on Joshua's stream had said uh, I, th they feel like the, the PID tuning doesn't matter as much now with the RPM filters. And it, that's such an interesting comment because if you were building sloppier or with lower quality components, um, then I agree with that because in those cases, in previous Blade of Flights, you would have to cripple the tune. You would have to come down from the, st the stock tune uh, to, to get the damn thing to fly. They, they would just fly away on the stock tune because there's an arm that's half broken, there's a motor that's out of balance, prop that's out of balance, um, a shitty uh, gyro that's failed, stuff like that. If you build clean, it's actually kind of the opposite of that. If you build clean, the stock tune will be very, very, um, oh, what's the word? It'll be uh, very, it, it's like a generalized tune that everything should work on. It's not a dialed in tune. Betaflight is the software that's expected to do that, quite frankly. Um, Kiss and Flight One, they the tune on those is more jacked up from the it, it, better. It, it's more cranked up, I should say, um, right out of the box. That's why a lot of people say that Kiss and Flight One fly better, in my opinion. My experience has been that Beta Flight, if you take a little bit of time, and and this is one of the things I talk about on the Patreon. I've got a couple posts about it. Really, just shrinking down pig tuning, pig tuning into <laughs> pig tuning. Nice. <laughs> shrinking down PID tuning into bite-sized pieces that are easy to understand. Um, and if you do that, you can crank the tune up in Betaflight way beyond what you can get in KISS or Flight 1 because Betaflight is now a lot better from the RPM filtering at crushing the vibrations that are getting into the gyro. So yeah, with a clean rig, uh, in my opinion, PID tuning is even more important because you can just go ham and really hammer some some big values in there and not have issues with flyaways or oscillations or any of the other shit that typically happens when you crank a PID tune up. When you do that, specifically with the P gain, when you crank the P gain way up so that you what you were seeing was a 6S rig on 1750 kV motors. 
The forest equivalent of that is like 2650 KV, so it's a high KV setup. It's got a shitload of power, um, and it's carrying around a Hero 7. That setup, the P gains are up in like the 70s or maybe even the 80s. It's nuts. Like, you come off the sticks, and that thing slams into place and does not move. It is absolutely bananas. And then the D gains, now that we've got D min, uh, the the actual D gain, which is the highest value that the D the, the, um, the derivative will ever hit, they're up in the 70s and 80s, I believe. So again, when it when it starts to get into prop wash, the D gain skyrockets um, because that's the way that the D gain works now. The the D gain stays at the D minimum, which is like 25, 26, and then when the flight controller starts to have bad behaviors that D is the solution to, it rockets that D gain up. So when you get that prop wash, when you really need crazy D gain, you got it. It boosts it up for you. And then as soon as it smooths out, it drops it back down. Just another thing that beta flight has that flight one and, and kiss don't. And I think it makes a big difference if, like I said, you build clean. And if you're willing to spend a little bit of time reading about this stuff and learning about it, or if you just ask me, <laughs> if you come to these streams and you ask me, I will go over everything I just did uh, and get you guys into a place where your beta flight rig can fly absolutely dialed in. And um, yeah, it's a it's a very special thing. What I will absolutely admit is that KISS and Flight One have a different feel to them. Absolutely no questioning that. And a lot of what we're doing in this hobby when we're flying is based on being comfortable, is based on uh, the, this, this you know, X factor of feel. So if for some reason you go and you fly KISS or Flight One and it just connects with your brain better, awesome, fly that forever. I don't think they're as good as Beta Flight, but they are still very, very good. Um, but just understand that it's not, you can go harder on the PID tune in Beta Flight, um, in my experience. And that makes a big difference, especially when you start doing shit like flying in wind or flying in bad conditions or, you know, your rig starts to get beat up. Having these extra features, D-Man, RPM filters, um, uh, the uh, iTerm Relax, these are things that are kind of game changing in Betaflight that allows it to, basically what they've done is they've taken the bad behaviors that we used to tune out with the PID tune and they've built very specific things to handle just those. iTerm Relax, for example, is was very specifically made to handle bounce back. Previously, we would have to to set or tune bounce back with our D gain, so we couldn't really tune the D gain for feel. We had to tune it for this bad behavior. With iTerm Relax, that goes out the window. You tune iTerm Relax to handle bounce back, and now you can tune your D gain to handle stuff very specifically like prop wash. Um, RPM filters are just the, flat out the best filtering that we've got. So, I mean, that's, it's just better. It's just better than anything else out there. So that's huge. Um, D-min, that was another thing that was developed specifically to deal with one specific thing in that we couldn't run the D-gains high enough to crush all of the prop wash. So the, the Betaflight devs set up this system where You've got one value, D min, which is where the D gains sit 99% of the time. And then they developed something that allows the, the flight controller software to understand when prop wash is going to start. And now it can boost that D gain up. So you've got a couple other values for how quickly it boosts it up. You've got a value for how early it boosts it up. And then you have your actual D gain, which is the maximum number that it can get to. Um, and again, the, the other two pieces of flight software don't have that. So flat out, like no questions asked, you cannot run as high of a D gain on the other two pieces of software until they develop something like this. So there you go. There's my opinion because I've been getting a lot lately of beta flight versus kiss versus flight one. They're all incredibly good and they all have pluses and minuses. But in my experience, which has been a bunch, I spent two months flying KISS, another two months flying um, uh, Flight One, and I'm talking about flying the shit out of it every single day on my lunch break, five or six batteries for two months. You know, that's 60 times 
no, probably less than that, probably 50 times 4 or 50 times 5. It's a shitload of batteries, right? That's plenty of time to get the feel for the software and, and figure out what works and what doesn't. So there's my opinion on that. Uh, let's actually dive into the chat now <laughs> that I've gotten a half an hour worth of rants out of the way. Uh, well, I guess that was a chat question. Cool, yeah, yeah, so we're already in the chat. Uh, Shane asks, new Emacs 1606s? We're going to dig into the uh, Acrobrat hopefully in a little bit here, but yeah, I have gone back to... So I spent about six months flying Emacs 1606s on Betaflight 357 and Betaflight 4.0, and they would always come down burning hot. The, the main reason for that is these are racing motors, so they're very notchy. That notchiness puts a ton of vibrations into the frame, which then get up into the gyro. There's only so much that soft mounting the gyro and tuning your filters can do. Uh, and these guys and a lot of other motors out there, quite frankly, um, pretty much all of the, um, I almost said hobby wing. No, it's, uh, oh, for God's sakes, brother hobby. Pretty much all of the tiny brother hobby motors are horrendously um, notchy. They're also horrendously powerful, which is great. Uh, but now, and this is what was this truly blew my mind. These motors that were full-blown unflyable on Betaflight 4 and even on 357, they are smooth as silk on the RPM filters. I took this rig and swapped it from the smoothest motors that we've ever had, which are the... they're over there, but uh, the Zing 1507s and the T-Motor 1507s. There has never been... Um, that I've run in the last two and a half years, there's never been a micromotor as smooth as those. I left that tune and those filters alone, and I just popped these, just swapped them off, popped these guys on that were unflyable, and it was fine. I did end up backing the tune off a little bit because it was at its razor's edge, but I was shocked by that. And these motors are what I'm going to now because these have a three millimeter motor shaft. The problem with the two 1507s that we've got, well, quite frankly, the problem with 99% of micro motors is the two millimeter motor shaft. If your rig is 200 grams all up or below, the two mil motor shaft is kind of okay. It can, it can sort of handle that much abuse. If you really want it to be super durable, get yourself down to like 180, 170 grams. But at 200 grams, that's kind of the maximum in my opinion, for a two inch, uh, two millimeter motor shaft in terms of durability. Uh, the Acrobrat is not 200 grams. Um, I'm up at like 260, 270 because I've got two, camera is, two cameras in there. I've got the old school run cam double layer board in here. Uh, so my Acrobrat is a little bit fatter than most. And yeah, at 260 grams, those 1507s with the two mil motor shaft were blowing up very, very quickly. Um, my most recent upload of uh, the Acrobrat on those Zing motors, I flew three batteries and they were done. Um, two of them actually. Two of them, the motors were bent so bad that they were completely useless. And for me, the way that I fly, that's unacceptable. Um, I do fly very hard, I crash a lot, I crash on concrete a lot, so if that's not you, then totally different story. But it's, I think it's kind of nice for you guys to have the, the, me as the extreme example of banging the living shit out of this gear to figure out what is truly um, durable, and then if you fly over grass a lot, you can kind of back that down a little bit. And you can, so like if you fly over grass all the time, you might be able to get away with, with the, uh, the 1507s on, on a 250, 260 gram Acrobrat. But if you're flying over concrete and you crash, don't do it. You're going to spend a lot of, you're going to buy a lot of $19 motors. And that's the other thing. They are very expensive micro motors. The Emacs motors are a lot less expensive and that's going to pile up. So that's where we're at with the Emacs 1606s. Um, I flew a couple batteries on it. And then it, it was kind of funny, on, on last week's um, stream, I had mentioned that somebody asked me which uh, ESC I had in here, and I told them it's the Hobbywing 20 amp BLLES ESC, and I mentioned that I don't love it, but it has held up. 
like really well and it's held up for a long time it's held up to a ton of different motors a ton of slams uh and so i put these 1606s on it and these 1606s had been on it for a what for those six months uh like the second battery in the the esc blue <laughs> one of the uh one of the motors stopped spinning so i have to do that's where we're going to tear this apart uh hopefully towards the end of the stream and uh, i'll put a gs25 in it and it'll be good to go possibly forever uh, the ESC did not blow up because 20 amps is not enough for these motors. It was totally fine for hundreds of batteries. Um, it blew up because I've beaten the absolute hell out of it. And I expected it to blow up a lot sooner than this. Um, I was also flying it on more pitchy props. These are the new T-Motor 3140s and they are a godsend. I don't love that the, there's the 40 pitch. Um, I didn't spend enough time to really figure out if that's too much pitch and, and if we've lost a lot of the throttle resolution that typically happens when you run a big pitchy prop. But the game changer with these props is they are durable as shit. I crashed it. So first of all, listen to that. Listen to that snap. Like it just pops right back up into place where like most of the other props make this noise. Right? Much lower pitch. They're bouncing back up a lot slower. Uh, these are crazy durable. I crashed this like five or six times in those two batteries. And all I did was very, very slightly bend one of the props on the left front down just a tiny little bit. The rest of these props are completely fine. They're dead straight. They've got the little, um, the little chips and shit in them that you get from crashing through Scraggle. So like on the tips, you get all those little chips and whatnot, but they didn't break like the the tips didn't break off they just kind of dented which means that they're still perfectly balanced and they still and the like i said the pit tune is still jacked up on this thing um so yeah very 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 impressed by these t-motor 3140 props and it didn't seem like like i was lacking in throttle response i did a couple really low runs down the, the that's how i i determine um low throttle, mid throttle resolution as I get two inches off the ground um, and just put the nose down and I'll do passes at different speeds because as you, as you add more angle of attack, props act differently. Um, the reason why mini quad props are so different than any other pusher propeller out there for airplanes, airplane propellers sit like this all the time. All they have to deal with is air coming in this direction. Mini quad props are sort of the opposite. We're getting air in this direction, we're getting air in that direction, that direction, and eventually we'll get it in this direction. Um, and then we start doing acrobatics and we, we get like a backflow of air and all kinds of wacky stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's how I tell, uh, that's how I determine throttle resolution is I'll do a pass very slowly, at a lower angle, then the next pass will be a little bit faster, the next pass is a little faster, and I just see how reliably I can fly very, very, very close to the ground because on a so on a uh, mini quad a five inch mini quad i can do that all day long um i was probably doing it some of that in that raw clip that you guys saw uh and i will not stop until a micro has that same resolution and has that same perfectly matched motor and prop and all up weight combination so yeah there's that what else do we have uh oh david news Wife says, thank you for the chocolates. You're certainly welcome. Uh, all of the, other than the, the overseas ones, all of the giveaways from the last two weeks went out. And uh, Chris and I threw some surprises in there for you guys. Hope you liked it. Uh, yeah, there's that. Since I know somebody will ask, it's just water. Uh, not 600 P gain, 60 proton go. <laughs> Yeah, somebody asked me what what MW I was on, so I I, I thought they might have typed the wrong thing, but I said six hundred because that's what the uh, tramps run at. <laughs> uh, okay, what else do we have? Snowing in Detroit. Oh, that sucks. Sharp Pizza. Sharp Pizza. Come on, give me that story. I need to know what your uh, what your name's all about. I don't know what a Sharp Pizza is. Uh, Doc Murdoch Doc is monolingual in the house, listening while I drive through Arizona, heading back to New Mexico. From crazy California. Very cool. Drive safe, brother. Uh, okay. 
What else do we have here? Jacob is watching from Disney World. Damn, I am jealous, Jacob. Uh, ooh, Thomas Bird's getting the frame and his HDO 2s tomorrow. Now I'm even more jealous. Um, GW FPV is back, he says. Uh, back from flying, says Sterling. OCD FPV. Uh, what else do we have? Big name in the Deadwood Old Western. Very cool. Okay, I'm going to rip through these comments here because we got a bunch of stuff to do. We're going to jump right into the uh, pilot spotlight once I get caught up on these. Uh, Proton to go is doing anxiety therapy himself. Important to treat yourself right. Yeah, that's very, very true. Um, men, in general, in my opinion, have no idea what... A, what self-care is. I didn't... The two words, self-care together, I didn't know what that was. I'd never heard that until um, Kristen, my wife, said it in some context or I read an article or something like that. Um, if you have mental illness issues, self-care is horrendously important. Um, quite frankly, it's... If, if you deal with severe depression, um, as I do, it is the difference between potentially hurting yourself um or even worse so yeah type self just look out for the word self-care um us men have a very hard time with that right because we're just supposed to tough it out right if if we're feeling sad if we're feeling depressed we're just supposed to tough it out and cheer up cheer um and that's not how depression works um if it was that easy i would have done it a long time ago right like, every single time somebody tells me, oh, your life's not that bad, just cheer up. It's like, oh, well, thanks. It, it's funny, right? They think they're they're saying something positive, but they're actually highlighting the worst part of depression. And it's very hard to hear that. Like, the first couple times you hear it, you're like, yeah, whatever. Once you've heard that 20, 30 times, it hurts. Because don't you think I would have just cheered up if I could? Right? Like... That's the really shitty thing about depression is that it just doesn't go away and it kind of defies all logic and you have very little control over it. Um, but self-care is one of the only things you can do. And this is just enjoying yourself, just unplugging for a while, just doing the things that you love, but trying to kind of... So FPV is kind of interesting, right? Like, oh, I'm going to do something... I. I Something that happens to me a lot is I'll get into kind of a tailspin of depression and I'll go, oh, okay, I know what will make me feel better. I'll go out and fly. My flying style of crashing a lot um, kind of sucks sometimes when that happens. I go out, I start flying. I'm in a terrible headspace, so I'm already limited as to how I'm going to fly. Typically, I'll go into autopilot mode, which is flying very, very hard. And now I start crashing and now I start breaking shit. And at that point, it is no longer self-care. It's kind of self-harm because I'm breaking shit that's going to cost me money that I don't have. <laughs> um, and I'm just pissed because I'm flying like an idiot. Every once in a while, I do that. I go out and I get really lucky and I put in a couple good batteries and I do feel better. But more often than not, uh, and at this point, I don't. I, I don't do the things that I enjoy typically when I am in a depressive state. Uh... But there are some things that you can do. Find thing, or you know, what I've learned is if I am flying when I'm in that space, I, I I just do like cinematic stuff. Like I'll just go up in the in the treetops and just cruise along the treetops and just do safe stuff. Maybe I'll go out over in a grass field and, and just nail my tuning and, and just sit there and tune, 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 tune. Um, so yeah, be careful with that with this hobby. Th this hobby can be very very frustrating. Um, I will typically not build when when I'm in that state. Because building can be very, very frustrating, specifically with micros. I will I will fix 5-inch rigs, but I will typically not touch micros if, if I'm in that headspace. Because I'll get pissed off and just want to smash the shit out of everything. <laughs> um, so, yeah. By the way, if you get very upset and want to smash things very quickly, I hate to break it to you, but you probably have depression. That's one of the main 
factors of depression. I know you think it's anger management problems, and I'm sure anger management could help, um, but that is a very, very specific giveaway of depression, is when you just fly off the handle like, like that. Um, and especially when you do it with inanimate objects. <laughs> um, because it's just insane, right? It's insane to get so mad at, at, at an ESC. Uh, so, yeah. Join that group, man. You'll learn a lot. Uh, we're going to post a ton to get it rolling. And the more you know, right? I don't remember what the, uh, what the theme song is for the more you know. And quite frankly, only the old heads are going to remember it. Here we go with the chat. We're almost caught up. It's only 3.50, so we've only blown an hour talking and ranting. Uh, Want to get fly? Five bucks. Thank you, brother. Happy holidays, my friend. Happy holidays to you as well. Um, I hope you're stateside and you can come tomorrow night and um, jump in on the Patreon and maybe win a giveaway. <laughs> uh, what else? What else? What else? All right, we're good. Link for the talent. Okay, awesome. What did the chat just do? Come on now. Oh my god. Okay, so there's a lot of chat. I thought I was at the bottom of the chat, but it's because I was holding the, uh, I was holding the, the mouse button. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people mention smoking weed. Yes, you can stuff it all down. <laughs> stuff it down with brown. You can do the same thing with alcohol. Um, you just got to be careful because you're not dealing with the issue. You're just pushing it down. You need to, to understand that. Um, the only way to truly fix it is talk therapy possibly going to a psychiatrist and, and getting on meds. Um, I did a lot of talk therapy for a lot of years. It works incredibly well. Eventually, uh, in my mid thirties, it got to be too much. And I went to a psychiatrist and started my journey on meds. It is a journey. Um, they will not prescribe you something that makes you happy. Um, they are not happy pills. They are anti-suicide pills, to be quite honest with you guys. Um, but if you stick with it and you work with your psychiatrist, find one that you like, um, they will get you on meds that can help a lot. And they have very little side effects when you get the right ones. So there you guys go. All right. I'm going to try to stop talking about depression. I just setting up that group and I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, I started listening to one of my favorite podcasts dealing with it, which is called the hilarious world of depression. So it's on my brain right now, but let's talk more FBB happy shit. <laughs> um, cool. I'm going to just blast through these. If I missed your question, tag at Ciotti FPV so it lights up in orange for me and I will answer it. Jason Peters did that and asked me, what's your favorite camera? It is the Runcam Micro Eagle. Here's four of them. Uh, somebody was blowing them out on Black Friday and I break these a lot. So I got a whole bunch of them. And I run them with this uh, RC25G lens. So out of the box, uh, out of the box on, f so this does 16.9 and 4x3. 16.9, it's 170 field of view. 4x3, it's 140 field of view. That's pretty normal. The, the, um, a lot of these cameras have 16x9 sensors, excuse me, uh, and they just crop it for 4x3. The RC25G lens takes that 140 field of view on 4x3 and widens it to somewhere around 160 to 170. Um, what I like about that is that I do a lot of like wacky side sliding shit, and backwards shit, and 140 field of view just feels like I'm looking through binoculars. I want the maximum amount of field of view without, without a ton of fisheye. Um, one of the reasons I stopped running Fox Ears is because when you get the, the wide fields of view on those, you get a bunch of fisheye. Um, for whatever reason, this Micro Eagle, um, and just run cams in general, to be honest, uh, they don't fisheye like crazy when, when you get the wide field of view. Um, and yeah, the, the other reason I run this is this has a bigger sensor in it than any other camera, and it's got the big M12 lens. So this lets in tons of light. Uh, the two videos ago, uh, two of my edits ago, flying around downtown Atlanta, it was like dark, dark, like full blown dark out. And in the goggles, it was daylight. It was black and white daylight because the cameras switched to black and white to, to 
what they do is they take all the colors and just make that white and then it, it you get more light um, as black and white so yes I was flying through black and white but I could see everything um, and that's why I was able to keep flying uh, without fear of getting lost or killing someone or bashing into somebody's window so there you go that's my stance on cameras Cadex cameras I don't run because of the terrible quality control issues that they have um, their Tarsier has been incredible and I love that but that's the only of their cameras that I will run uh, currently and I know that the Rattel I guess it is is really really good but Kebab for example is has gotten two in a row that were bad right out of the box and that's that's insane uh futures we're talking about explosive fruits what's this conversation what's a good 20 by 20 esc uh ben watkins calls out the speedix gs25 absolutely that's down in my uh, description that is the smallest lightest best uh 20 by 20 esc i've found there are plenty of other 20 by 20 well so it's the smallest lightest bl heli 32 esc that i've found there are other 20 by 20 ESCs that have BL Heli 32, but they are bigger. And in most micro builds, you're really like, like packaging everything in there is tough. So when they start to make these ESCs bigger and they bump them out from the 20 by 20 holes, um, it can be a real pain in the ass to get those to clear uh, in, a, in a tight, lightweight micro rig. And Honestly, like the problem that we have with micros is power to weight. Like we're we're not quite there yet with the power to weight ratio, and if you've got a frame with a ton of extra space in it to clear that big e big ESC, that's going to be a frame that's too heavy. Uh, so you know the, the the frames that I run, they're tight. Like everything is on top of each other because we're trying to get that extra one or two or three grams uh, reduction because that makes a difference. That makes a big difference. If you've got a hundred gram rig and you save two grams. It's a two percent weight savings. That's that's significant. Um, so that's kind of my thought process on the ESC side of things. Uh, what else do we have? All right, I'm 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 banging through these comments. We're we're getting to the bottom because we got five minutes before it's four o'clock, and by four o'clock I need to get over to Pilot Spotlights and, and some of the actual stuff we're doing. Uh, Proton to go tag me and says has a throttle limit. Uh, has a throttle limit anything I'm assuming he meant to say does a throttle limit have anything going for it I feel I have much more power than I need oh okay um, so proton to go Joshua has a video on uh, throttle limit on a on a dial on on most transmitters there are rotary dials that we don't have a use for this is the best use for that rotary dial um, he walks you through it, you set it up on the rotary dial, and then you can literally dial the top of your throttle up and down. Throttle curves are great for whoops. I, I run them um, on every single whoop I've got because the hover point is like halfway up the throttle on the whoop. So you're just wasting the majority of the, of the bottom half of the throttle. So I will put a permanent throttle curve on those to bring the throttle point down to what I'm used to, which is you know, on, on every other rig that I've got, there's like a point where I think it should hover. And I just kind of work, just keep going back and forth with that throttle curve so, till it feels right to me. Um, on a five inch rig, like if, if you were doing something like running 6S on a 2400 kV motor, that's when a throttle um, limit would be really, really nice. But what you want to remember is the PID loop is not going to have that throttle limit on it. So if the error correction loop in there needs a ton of power it's going to get a ton of power and it could blow up motors escs um everything because 6s on 2400 kv is mega for a five inch prop uh so keep that in mind but yeah throttle limits are awesome having it on the rotary dial is great and you should all do it because it's not that hard to do and it feels good to have those rotary dials actually do something <laughs> all right uh, oh, so the, the other half of that, I don't run throttle limits on any of my other stuff because the hover point is not, like the hover points are all pretty close to one another. And when you start putting throttle curves on, you can make one rig feel like way different than another. Um, I would just rather have it be relatively one-to-one. -one, and as long as the throttle limit or the hover point is similar, 
that makes, you know, the Acrobrat's throttle pickup feel like the Acrobrat. So th this rig feels like this rig. Um, in a perfect world, yes, I would do throttle limits on every single rig so that at every step in the throttle, each one of these rigs felt exactly the same. But my God, would that take time. <laughs> And with how often I change parts, I, I'm just not doing it. Uh, so, yeah. But if you've got the time, you can do a, uh, a throttle curve on every single one of your rigs to make them feel identical, other than their weight. Their weight will also, you know, obviously always have a different feel to it. But in terms of the throttle, you know, I add 70, 75% throttle and my rigs all have a six to one power to weight ratio, let's say. Um, you could do that. It would take a ton of time, but that would be kind of cool. And uh, it would help you as a pilot for certain. Uh, Supercell, how do you get current on the GS25? You don't. Um, you gotta, it doesn't have a current sensor. Uh, it doesn't have telemetry out, ESC telemetry out. It also doesn't have uh, a current out. So you just have to use the, the best guess um, which is in beta flight. Uh, so, and the way you do that is you charge up a 4S 450, let's say, um, and you fly it with your, your MAH counter in the corner. And when it's time for you to land, when low battery, low battery, low battery, that MAH counter, you just look at where it's at. Typically it'll be at like 7,000 MAH because they're usually way the hell off for, for micros. Um, and then you go in to the, to the power tab in beta flight and there's a scale and you change that scale and then you fly another battery and you see where that MAH counter comes down at and then you adjust the scale. You can actually adjust the scale in the OSD. That's how you really do it. You fly, but you bring 10 batteries, fly one, see where it's at, change the scale in the OSD, fly that battery, see where it's at, change the scale in the OSD. And you can usually get it pretty damn close. What it's doing is it's just looking at your throttle and it's it's speeding up or slowing down the timer as per where your throttle is. Um, so it's not perfect because different motors are different efficient uh, or have different efficiencies at different uh, uh, amounts of power, you know, throttle points. So it's not perfect, but we tend to fly the same normally, right? We tend to do the same like big throttle blip uh, we kind of have like a pacing to our flying typically. So that's usually pretty damn good. You, sh you can usually get that scale almost perfect. And when you see 450 MH in the corner, that land now is going to be screaming at you. Uh, all right. What else do we have? I think we're good. Oh my God. No, we're not. The chat did the thing again. Oh my God. You guys are, whoo. I'm going to rip through the Zachary Chafin. <laughs> Uh, keeping it real, appreciate much to the comments, horrible topic to avoid. Yep. Self-care, both mental and physical, uh, are very important items to keep in the front end. Yeah. I, I gotta get better about, uh, self-care, physical self-care. I am in horrible shape. I am 38 years old. Um, I've been rail skinny my entire life. I have a crazy metabolism, so I haven't really had to worry about, um, physical self-care, but now at 38, I'm in terrible shape. Um, so I need to, I need to get my ass on the elliptical treadmill, bike, whatever, which I'll get to, I'll, I'll get there. Uh, mental is, is first and physical is second, but we'll get there. Uh, Marcel Roberts says truth. You're an awesome person. Thanks brother. I really appreciate that. Um, I know I'm very curious as to how many, um, I'm very curious to what's going to happen with this Facebook group because I've put depression related posts in Rotor Riot before and like almost every single time they've blown up hundreds and hundreds of comments and likes and shit like that. So um, I think this group might be a really good thing um, because we're all men, right? Like there's less than 1% of this hobby is, is women. Uh, not that they don't deal with it, but I, I just think um, when I really think about it, it's kind of one of the only things that sucks about being a white straight male <laughs> um there had to be something right so tobias boone what version of beta flight would you recommend for the Isheen trash can i have 375 uh i think it's on my other quads rpm filters are so good that across the board 
Betaflight 4.1, no question. Doesn't matter the rig, doesn't nothing matters. Betaflight 4.1, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinion, is so much better than any other piece of flight software that we've had that it's kind of crazy not to run it. <laughs> the the it just it crushes vibrations and oscillations so hard and so accurately. I at least a dozen times. So I run uh, T Motor fifty one forty three props. They're very light. Uh, they're very efficient, and the throttle resolution is incredible on them. But they are not durable. They're I don't want to say they're not durable, um, but they're in this like middle ground of durability. They're not fragile, but they're 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 not they're definitely not durable. Um, they're in the middle, maybe a little bit below the middle. And what happens to them a lot is when you go crashing through Scraggle, which is happening all the time now that it's Scraggle season. Um, an entire blade will just blow off the damn things. And when that used to happen, and quite frankly, if that happens in KISS or Flight 1, that rig is unflyable at that point. It's either going to just lose its shit and just flip out so bad that you literally can't fly it, or if you can fly it, it's going to cook that motor or ESC. Um, with the RPM filters, uh, one of those three harmonics targets that vibration that's happening from that one blade being missing and I can fly the damn thing back to myself it sounds horrible <laughs> the whole way back but when it gets back to me the motor on that side is still cold and I mean that's that's ridiculous like that and that could be the difference between full-on losing a quad right like what if props will just blow up like a, a mismanu or like a bubble in the in the mold or something on one of the props if you're out bombing over the ocean and you go full McGillicuddy on the throttle, um, if there's a little weakness in that prop, it could send one of those blades off. And now you got two blades on one of your props. It'd be really nice to be able to lift that thing home, wouldn't it? And not lose a $300 rig with a two, three, four hundred dollar $400 GoPro on it. Game-changing shit. 4.1 is next level. Absolutely next level. Uh, all right. We're almost there. We're almost there. Oh, there's a bunch in a row. Okay, Tiago, is there any re reason to use a single gyro and not the dual? Uh, yes, the single gyros are MPU 6000s. All the dual gyros that I've ever seen are 32K um, ICM gyros. And I hate the ICM gyros. They are very, very picky. Uh, they get overloaded and they're kind of pointless. The, the Betaflight runs at 4K. Uh, shit, KISS runs at 1K. Uh, kind of no point for 32K in my opinion, and in Betaflight's opinion. The, the Betaflight devs decided that they were not full-blown, not going to support 32K anymore because it's just worthless. They're, they're, what they explain is that it's garbage data. You're, you're just bringing in more trash. Um, and that at 4K, or in KISS's case, at 1K, you get plenty of data um, to work with and that reduces CPU cycles and all, all kinds of other stuff. The problem is apparently the MPU 6000s are no, be, no longer being made. So buy a bunch of flight controllers. Um, I'm gonna buy a ton of Talon. At, like basically at this point, every order I do, I throw a Talon F7 on there because I need, I want to have a whole bunch of those for when the MPU, MPU 6000s go away. So yeah, you might wanna do that. Think about that. Uh, John Larson asks, what motor size slash KV do you recommend for a 3-inch uh, BQE rip squeak build? I'm okay with 4S to 6S, whatever you think is good for freestyle. Um, John, I'm going to send you to my Patreon for hopefully you got 3 bucks. Don't get a cup of coffee maybe Monday morning. Um, for 3 bucks, you can jump on there. I just wrote an article about that. Um, it's got each one of my combos that I've found to be best at each different weight. Weight is is really the determining factor um, when you when you glom everything together. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, there's a big word hot here. Let me. Uh, it's this post right here. So I'm gonna refer you over. There. Hard line on anybody. Oh, I probably didn't have the mic going just now. Son of a bitch. Uh, 
I wonder how much you guys didn't hear. I th you probably just didn't hear that I push people to the Patreon because I think for three bucks, a minimum of three bucks, you're going to get a hundred bucks a month worth of savings in not buying shitty parts. And it's also a really cool community of people. The, the, the people that are on that Patreon right now are awesome people. And we have a really good time hanging out. I got a couple of Facebook groups where we hang out. Um, if you guys bug me enough, I guess I'll do a Discord at some point. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, JTJ250 didn't tag me, but he put it on all capitals so I can see it. Um, hey, Seattle, what's the best way to tune current sensor in Betaflight? Oh, cool. I already answered that. So, yeah, sweet. <laughs> uh, Tiago, no, wait, no, I'm down here. C Pulse, 5 inch, 600 gram rig. What motor to use? 20, uh, 2207, 2250? Uh, depends on the C rating, right? Or the, um, the cell rating. If you're 4S, you're going to want to be somewhere in the 24 to 2600 kV range. If you're 5S, I believe it's somewhere around 2100-ish, um, above or below. On 6S, it's going to be anywhere from 1600 kV up to like 1800 or so. Um, so there's that. 2207 versus 2306, which is what I prefer, uh, is a very personal decision for you. I've flown both quite a bit. Uh, 2207 is more fun, if I'm completely honest with myself, because it has a huge huge amount of power at the top of the throttle so like at the top of the throttle you just Wee! and you go screaming up into the sky and it's hysterical it's super 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 fun when i watch that footage back it's not as fun because i'm just waiting to come down because i've, I've blasted up into the sky four or five times already in that battery um so i moved to 2306s and what i found is so a 23 23 versus 22, that's the width of the stator. That is free mechanical torque, free mechanical leverage. Um, same thing as trying to, you know, you, you get a flat tire on the side of the highway, you take the dinky little shitty um, wrench in the trunk of your car, and if the lug nuts have been pounded on there, you won't be able to get it off because it's a dinky little, you know, one foot lever that you're working on. Put a a, a tube in your trunk that's another foot or maybe two feet that slides over that um, dinky little lug nut wrench and you can now grab it all the way out here and that creates a ton more torque for the same amount of force because it's moving it in a smaller you know you're using the same amount of force out here but it's only trying to move it a tiny little bit so that ends up being more torque on the the object in the middle um, the, our motors work the same way so a 2306 has more torque, uh, so it it responds quicker, which makes it tune easier and tune better. It can literally speed up and slow down the props quicker because it has a natural mechanical torque advantage, and uh, they're also lighter. 2306s are a little bit lighter than 2207s. Um, and what I found is when I moved over to them, I would... Like when I would power loop a tree, I would be nice and close to the tree. Whereas with the 2207s, I would hammer up way over the tree. Yes, if I flew enough, I could tune that out of my brain. But why? Why would you, like, there has to be a real compelling case for the 2207 for me to force myself to, to run that, right? And for somebody else, maybe 2207 is the way their brain works. And maybe they can perfectly power loop a tree. But... It was not like that for me. And if I can make my gear suit whatever the hell is in my brain that makes me think or like whatever pacing I have to how quickly I, I raise and lower the throttle, lift the throttle, shit like that. If I can tune the gear to that so I don't have to retrain my brain, I can, instead of wasting time retraining my brain, I can spend that time getting better as a pilot. Uh, and that's... I've been doing that for a long time, and that was one of the things that got me over a, a one of many plateaus that I've had in in my piloting. Uh, so that's, I think that's pretty much top to bottom my stance on uh, five inch motors. If you really want tons of power, there's 228s, uh, 2208s, there's 2407s. Um, 
if you want to run big pitchy props, that's when I would maybe go to a 22.8 or even better, a 24.07. Um, but for a standard like 600 gram five inch rig, in my opinion, 23.06 is it. And I also run low, well not low KV, but standard KVs. I don't run high KV setups. So on 6S, I am 1600 KV. And on 4S, I am 2400 KV, uh, which is kind of like the minimum that's that's really made. I think there's maybe like one or two 2350s out there, but I don't know of any 2300s or 2250s. Um, 2400 KV, it's, it's just like such a nice number. And it's just... It's such a good amount of power. It's, it's not a lot. It's not too little. It's kind of just in this little sweet spot where you can really um, have something that's very sensitive and, and you have amazing throttle resolution for when you're like flying under a park bench or something that's real, real, real technical. But then when you hammer it, you can throw it over a, a five-story building like it's nothing. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and that, that the point of that is also like, the, the more power, the less resolution, right? If, if you've got a throttle stick that moves this far, and in this throw, you've got a thousand horsepower, to do something like small and, and, and technical is going to be really hard because when you move the throttle a millimeter, it's going to produce a hundred horsepower. Whereas if you've got the throttle travel and you've got 500 horsepower, you're going to be able to be a lot more, you're going to have twice the throttle resolution, right? And, and that makes a big difference. Um, when you start to really get good and, and you start to really turn it into a game of inches where it's like, oh, there's a pole coming. Let me get an inch off of it. Ah! Uh, so, yeah, I basically run the least powerful setup that I can because the least powerful setup has the most throttle resolution. And the more throttle resolution, the easier it is to fly. So that maybe will help some of you guys because it took me a long time to figure that out. I was only able to figure it out from my motorsports background. Um, the first car that I autocrossed uh, was a 96 Cobra, Mustang Cobra, with 300 plus horsepower to the wheels, blah, 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 big ass tires and shit. Uh, and it was very hard to be um, super technical with that. Uh, autocross is a game of inches. You wanna be um, the, the little lip on the bottom of the cone, right? And any old parking cone has a square on the bottom with a little lip on it, and then it's got the the, the cone part on top. Um, to be truly fast in autocross, you have to run that that lip on the bottom over, like like for real. You you actually have to be that close to the cone to perform on the level of, of some of these guys that run on the national tour. And when I moved over to a Miata, yes, it helped that it weighed half as much, but going from 300 to the wheels to 100 to the wheels made modulating the throttle a lot easier because in a rear wheel drive car when you're to get the most possible cornering force out of it it's actually sliding a little bit that you you maintain a 10 to 15 degree angle of um what's called uh, what's called slip angle which essentially what that does is that makes the rear tires do some steering too right normally if you just go into a corner and turn your front tires they have to do all that work and the rear just kind of drags along well, if you, if you apply throttle on corner entry to swing the rear out a little bit, you're still turning with the front tires, but you're also putting a little bit of inward angle on the rear tires, so they're actually driving you into the inside of the corner, and that's super, super technical. Like To get that right and to maintain that little bit of slip angle, that's, why, um, that's one of the reasons why you can kind of get really good at drifting pretty quick. Um, but to get fast at autocross or track days, it takes a long, long, long time. And it takes a lot of uh, track time to get there. Um, just because it's such a fine line. With, with drifting, you can fling it out at a 50 degree angle and just, and just all the smoke. And, and it looks awesome and it's super fun to do. Um, but eventually it's kind of like, all right, well, yeah, I guess I can spend more money and, and run with the, the big guns. Or you can do autocross and, and road race, and you just have this infinite skill ceiling, much like FPV. One of the things that I love about FPV is like there's no skill ceiling. It's it's just we haven't seen what we haven't seen the, somebody get to this point where they're like, all right, I can't be any better, right? Every time we see Steele, he's better than the last time. Every time we see Jay True, he's better than the last time we saw him, and 
That is awesome. I love hobbies that are like that because you don't burn out on them as easily. Um, Zachary Chafin called out that I lost audio. Okay, cool. Uh, Kantek Gudski asks, can you recommend an Acrobi alternative for indoors? I want good control just to cruise around the house. Uh, don't plan on racing. My Tiny Whoop recommendation is going to be the Newbie Drone Brushless across the board. Yes, it's a little more expensive, but it is so much more durable than anything out there. And the difference in the in cost that you'll pay up front, I guarantee you, will even out um, in six months or 12 months by the fact that you won't have to buy replacement frames, canopies, cameras, motors, props nearly as often. Um, the I, One thing I can say, there's some things that have kind of pissed me off about being involved in the in the prototype program with the newbie drone brushless whoop for the last few months uh but what i cannot say is that there's any other whoop that's more durable like period and it's because of the cockroach frame the, the cockroach frames are always just absolutely bomb proof they're a tiny little bit heavier but it is so worth it to be able to bounce that thing off the walls at full stank uh, so yeah, newbie drone brushless. I think it just came out supposedly. Um, some of the, the, the big problem that I've had with the, my main problem with the prototype is they, it seems like they kind of hung us out to dry a little bit. Um, that has nothing to do with you guys and I'm sure they didn't do it on purpose. So don't, uh, newbie drone is an amazing company. Um, I just think that they didn't, uh, fully think through some things in, in the prototyping program and uh, but the main problem that we've had that grounded most of us very early on they have fixed um, which is that they went to a smaller motor connector and the smaller motor connectors are not durable at all and they're also not the norm so you have to buy their motors but they put solder pads on the on the uh, on the board now so you can just yank that off cut your, um, get any motors, any brushless motor you want, cut the connector off it and just direct solder it right to the board. So, and, and the, what's cool about that too is that the brushless motors aren't like the brush motors where they're gonna fail after 20 hours of use. Uh, so yeah, it's good. It's real good, get it, you won't regret it. Uh, Blitz FPV, what low, SER, what low ESR cap do I need for a 2S toothpick? As soon as I punch out, my video goes static with horizontal black lines. Um, blitz that might, I mean, put a cap on it. It's, it's easy to do and maybe it'll fix it. I don't think it will fix it. Um, I think you need to look at, um, there's not much wiring going on. So the, the video wires that we use are unshielded and our boards have like MOSFETs and all kinds of nonsense throwing electrical noise all over the place. Um, Look at how your video wire is routed. Make sure it's not like right next to um, the the noisiest part is always the battery lead. So make sure your video wire is not right next to the battery lead, um, and just move your video wire around. Also move your antenna around. Sometimes the the antenna, um, the video antenna, and the receiver antennas can make each other angry. So move your antenna around. Uh, Look at how your video wire is run. Look at like the connection. Maybe your solder joint is starting to fail uh, because I don't think putting a cap on there will will fix it. Like I said, it might. Um, what's nice about just adding a cap as the first step is that caps only help. There's no negative to adding a, a, a little capacitor. Um, I guess on a whoop, you could, uh, on a toothpick, you could argue that they have some weight, but they don't have much weight. So yeah, put a little tiny cap on. Uh, so apparently on, and, and your question about the size, apparently on five inch rigs, the thousand UF caps are total overkill. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer, but, uh, the big old thousands, like I said, are, are supposedly overkill. I have heard from people smarter than me that these 330s are technically all that we need. And what's interesting about that is I, uh, and why I believe it is because when you buy an ESC uh, that comes with a capacitor, it's always one of these little ones. They never send these out with 1,000 UF capacitors. Um, and I'm sure that the, the ESC manufacturers don't want you to blow their ESC up, right? So 
on a toothpick, I mean, you could probably go real. So this is, like I said, 300 UF. I mean, you could probably go down to like a 100 UF or like, like what's this little guy? This little guy is 150 UF. I bet you this is all that you would need. Uh, maybe even smaller. Let me get this in here. So yeah, this is a thousand U, or a thousand, great. 150 UF, I don't think you can read it, especially because I'm shaking all over the place. But uh, yeah, this is all I would I would do on a, on a little toothpick, is a little 150, uh, or smaller, like I said. Okay, uh, I think, awesome. All right, let's get to these super chats. You guys rule. MC Creation sent 10 R dollars. Um, <laughs> hope he, he hopes I drink beer. I better drink beer because it's free for because it's for beer. I do, and I promise I will spend the ten R dollars on beer. <laughs> Thank you, I, MC. I, I typically don't. Um, I've actually stopped buying beer uh, probably about six months ago, just to save money. Um, I I've, I've really been trying to just drink water because. Anything other than anything with more flavor than water, like if you actually look at it and look at what you spend a month, it's it's like a camera worth of money. <laughs> so um, I typically only drink water, but I love beer, so I will I will get ten R dollars worth of beer. <laughs> um, John Larson, two bucks. Thanks, happy flying. You as well, John. Get out there and uh, crash through some scraggle. <laughs> I, man, I had a hell of a time with Scraggle today. It was, it was a spot with a lot of it, but, um, fuck, I hate it. I really hate it. Um, one thing I will say about the DJI system, uh, when I flew Jamie Ann's two weekends ago, is that you can see Scraggle a lot better. Um, and with, who was it, Caddix, I think, put out a VTS. So, what I've been waiting for with the DJI system, I mean, mainly what I've been waiting for is not to be broke, <laughs> but... That's never going to happen. Uh, the other thing I've been waiting for is I'm not going to get their controller. I'm perfectly happy with a QX7 and Crossfire. So the the air unit has both built in, so that's pointless. I've been waiting for a VTX only, HD VTX only that interfaces with the DJI system, and it's exactly what Caddx, I believe it is, just teased. Uh, oh, yawning. Uh, so, yeah, that's going to be really cool. Also, it's a very intriguing HD solution for micros, right? Because it's a VTX and DVR box all in one, right? Um, so that could be pretty cool, right? It, you don't have to screw around with dual lens nonsense. You've got a single lens that is sending you know, HD low latency feed directly to your goggles, and then you can put a, an SD card either in the quad or even in your goggles. I mean, that's really cool being able to record the HD in the goggles. That's awesome. Uh, so I'm pretty psyched about that. I, I, I kind of can't wait for that to shrink down to 20 by 20 because I'm, I'm pretty sure that one that they teased was 30 by 30. Um, once that comes down to 20 by 20, that'll be pretty slick. Okay. Oh, no onboarding for DVR, says Shane. Well, they'll get there. Um, when you look at like cameras a year ago to now, it's nuts. So a year from now, uh, we'll probably shit. We'll probably have 16 by 16 boards that'll do HD and send it back to the uh, to some sort of an HD goggle. So that should be good. Uh, okay, finally got caught up on the chat. Zachary Chafin says the B Brain brushless is up for pre-order on their website, but appears to be sold out. Um, okay. Oh. I missed all these comments. Cantex says there's no Acrobri in Europe. That's why I ask. Uh, here's my suggestion. Go to... Shit, man. I don't know what my suggestion is. I was going to say go to Kebab's Facebook group, um, but they're pretty specific about... There's a bunch of uh, Tiny Whoop Facebook groups. That's going to be my suggestion. Hopefully, you guys have Facebook. Shit, man. I'm, I'm very... Uh, behind on whoop stuff so I'm actually not gonna give you an opinion because it's gonna be an opinion that doesn't have facts behind it um, and there's nobody that like I trust enough to believe what they've told me so I'm gonna tell you that your best bet is to find some like faith uh, um, tiny whoop Facebook groups 
or whatever social media you've got and ask some of those people because they they're just going to be able to give you actual info what i will say though is when somebody recommends something to you ask them like politely where that like like oh do you have one or something like that or like have you ever had bad experiences with with uh, so if they're recommending a whoop board like just hit them with like you know okay awesome have you run any other boards in the, in the past that you've had bad experiences with that, you, that I should stay away from? Because 90% of people at that point are going to say, no, this is the only one I've ever bought. And they're recommending it because they, they're they they're financially invested in it, um, which is human nature. They're not doing that on purpose, right? I spend 100 bucks on something. Hell yeah, that thing is awesome. I, I spent 100 bucks. I don't want to feel like an asshole that got the wrong thing. Um, so... Hold on one second. Can you talk to Amazon Prime? Yeah. They might, um, I got a package coming that I would love to, uh, I would love to unboxing on the stream. Unbox on the stream. What's wrong with me? Uh, okay. Oh, it is a 20 by 20. No shit, Shane. Cool. Let me make sure I didn't miss any of these chats because the chat window does weird things and I did. I did. Explosive Fruits, awesome name, first and foremost, and most important. Um, but he asks, thoughts on the Diatone F7 stack? I've heard good things, but like I was just saying, I have not run them. I I have a, a, a small group of other pilots that I trust, and I have not heard from any of them that it's really good. Um, it could be the best flight controller ESC available but i'm i'm not just gonna yeah it's awesome go buy it that's that's insane um that's one of the things that is wrong with the internet uh like we were just talking about right you don't somebody's saying yes buy it it's awesome you have no idea what their background is like when when i reply to someone that's asking about gear i will try to like add more to it i i ran this 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 and this and this one was the best and that's why i'm suggesting it that's the reply that we should all be making, right? If, if somebody asks, how's the Micro Eagle? I'm thinking about getting one. If it's your only camera, you should say, it's the only camera that I've bought, but I love it. That, I mean, just with those couple extra words, that helped that person out a great deal. Um, we should all be doing that. Obviously, we don't. Um, I would encourage you guys, though, to break that whatever habit. I don't know. And, and do it. When, when you reply to somebody's comment, give it three more seconds and, and just say, this is the only one I've ever bought, but it's been great. And I've had it for six months. That's also important. The amount of time that you've had it is very important. You know, I just bought this. I just un I took it out yesterday. It's awesome. It's the best thing in the world. You should get it. Fuck you. Like, sorry, but fuck you. That's insane. You, you cannot do that. Um, so don't do it, guys. It, or just say more say more when you give people advice give them a little bit a little bit more it'll help them out a great deal especially because when you do that and four people after them don't do that thank you no so are they coming it's heavy so if you want to put the stream on hold for like a minute we both All have right. to carry up the stairs you guys are going to watch One minute. that raw rip again because <laughs> apparently there's something heavy outside <laughs> i think it's a cat tower or it might be a christmas tree Whatever. I gotta go. Be right back. Uh, I'm gonna... It's 4.30 already. We're gonna stream until at least 5.30, maybe 6. Because all I've done is <laughs> rant and rave, and I do want to do some other stuff. So, hold on. I'll be right back.
restart it. I thought I could bounce back. I thought I could bounce back and forth. Huh? Holy shit. That was heavy. Okay. See what I mean? In terrible shape. Um, it was heavy. I think it's our uh, Christmas tree. Fake Christmas tree. But <clears throat> I shouldn't be this out of breath. But I'll get there. <sighs> Alright. Good lord. Um, Supercell. Did the CLI command? Still has no motor. Hmm. We'll talk on Facebook. Uh, I'll figure it out. Uh, there was something else. There, there was something else where you... I'm going to have to move a pin. We'll talk about it on Facebook. Okay. Pilot spotlight time. Um, every week I'm trying to... Hold on. Okay. Every week, I'm trying to give you guys a new pilot to watch. Um, I feel that watching other pilots that are better than you is really, really important for inspiration. Um, what I want you guys to do, though, is throw this bullshit out where you go, I'll never be that good, or, oh, like... It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Um, I one of the other reasons I left motorsports is because it's way too competitive. Um, it is way more fun to be less competitive and just do something for the love of it rather than to be the best. Because if you're not the best, then you're a failure, right? Like you're garbage. You're you're shit. Second place is the first loser. You know, and all that. Um, so I try to remove competition from as much as I possibly can. Um, and now I forget what we were talking about. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, Pilot Spotlight. Right. Um, so yeah, finding new pilots and uh, subscribing to them and watching one or two flight videos a day I think is very, very important. It gives you all kinds of new ideas and different moves that you want to try. I was actually trying, um, I, I did a bunch of work today on uh, one of the moves from last week's Pilot Spotlight, uh, where he came in and then paused it like this, threw it full throttle, and for whatever reason, when you do that, if you pitch forward a little bit to keep the object uh, in sight, it really hides uh, the acceleration that you're generating with the quad, and then you can snap it flat, and it... And it's got this really neat thing where it just, it looks like all of a sudden you just reversed your direction. It's super cool. I would never have known that if, if we, I hadn't done the pilot spotlight on, I forget who it was last week. But yeah, it's really important and I think you guys should all do it and I'm going to help you out because I've spent a lot of time finding these people on YouTube because I want to watch 10 a day if I can. So today we're going to do Nicholas Gaillard. Um, I'm on a kick with EU pilots. Uh, where is... There it is. So, I'm also kind of on a cinematic kick. Um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. But, Nicholas Gaillard, a lot of subscribers. Hopefully you guys... I, I try to pick people that... hope in, in the hopes that you guys won't have heard of them. I, I want to show you guys new pilots. Um, so, like, if I do one of these and... Everybody's like, oh, we already know him. That's fine. I'll pick somebody else. But um, Nicholas Gaillard, awesome cinematic stuff. The most recent video of his, um, unfortunately, is from three months ago. But it is a FPV bucket list item for me. So let's dive in. Kill my mic. Is that the tree, baby? Was it the tree? Oh, really? Both? 
Oh, no tree. Oh, no, and then this. oh I, I got you. This is. I don't want to open it in case of something. This frame, I think. It looks like there's. Yeah, yeah, you can open it. I don't know what it was. That's a frame for my uh, the other size blip shift poster. Oh, the, the the red car one. Yeah. Yep. 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 So that's pretty gnarly. Uh, let's do one more. Yeah, total bucket list shit up in the clouds. I mean, you can get up in the clouds with an Arxis R, too. There's no reason I haven't done it, other than the fact that I've never... I don't usually look up, to be honest, but um, I've just never had a point where there were low clouds. That, like, you don't want to go for the for the, the high clouds. You want to, like, if, if you see a cloud that looks low, that's one that you can maybe get up into. Um, what's cool is there's no noise floor up there, so that's why like an RXSR will go all the way up. But um, what you want to be careful of is the null on your uh, antenna. So, oh god. Alright. Okay, so normally we want to fly with the transmitter like this, and the, the radiation pattern on uh, just normal like dipole style antennas is like a donut. It's as strong, it, the, the maximum strength is directly perpendicular, 90 degrees, and then it gets a little bit less strong, a little bit less strong, a little bit less strong, a little, little bit less strong, and then straight up and straight down are the nulls, and they're, they're not strong at all. So it, it looks like a donut, right? Because maximum strength farthest out, and then less, 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 and then the null, it really... Um, if you were to, when they visualize the, uh, the, uh, the radiation pattern, if you start flying straight up and you've got your null pointing straight up and you end up directly above yourself, that's going to suck. So <laughs> when, um, when you decide to do that and you push out, just put it like this and you put it like that now straight forward and straight up, right? This, this whole direction is your your strongest bit so and I've, I've done that while I'm flying before like when I every once in a while I'll go up really high to show the whole area um, and it's just when, when you're going up high like that there's usually a point where you're on the chairlift and, and you're just and you just take your thumbs off the right stick and man you're good so yeah keep that in mind if you're gonna go real high or real far um, with the it, it makes a huge difference it really really does if you point the null straight at your quad 200 yards away is going down <laughs> unless it, uh, i guess if there's enough uh if there's enough stuff for the signal to bounce off of i guess you'd be all right but um yeah nulls are real and you also want to keep in mind the the nulls on your rig um one of the reasons to run the receiver antennas in an l is that they cancel each other's nulls out right so the null on this top one is straight up but this back one 
its strongest point is straight up. So you've totally canceled this null out. And the same happens here, right? Weakest, but strongest. So a setup like this, the only real null is actually, see, and you can still see a little bit of it down here. If you, I guess if you're flying right at yourself and you, and you stop, you could technically put this antenna completely behind the battery and it does not go through lithium. Um, but you would have this little tip down here that would, that would still show out. So that's, yeah, that's why an L on the, as far back as you possibly can, there's almost no orientation that you can put this in um, that you're going to have a, a null pointing directly at yourself. Uh, the, immortal, uh, the immortal T's, so that's what Steele calls the immortal L. That's just a name that he made up. The immortal T, so you would think that this would have a horrible null uh, on either end, and it, it does have a null there, but from what I understand, they, they somehow use this, uh, this part of it to, to radiate something uh, to cover up those nulls so that they're not as bad. Um, I don't know. It, it works really well, and it's very, very durable when it gets hung up in the props. And pretty much everybody runs these, so they got to be good. I haven't had a problem. All right. I saw a couple questions. Let's blast through them. Ask me the third time because I bought a buy replacement mama board. Cantech, did I miss you asking this question twice? Oh, you probably didn't uh, tag me. Yeah, you guys got to tag me at CIDFPV so that it shows up in orange um, because as this grows, I can't even come close to reading all the comments. Um, there was a time where I could, and that was awesome, but things get bigger and more popular. So, yeah, but just tag me at CIDFPV and it'll show up in orange. Uh, it won't show up in orange for you though. That, that's, that's, remember that. You're not crazy. It only shows up in orange for me. Uh, Cantech is asking, Friday's Mamba F405, can you recommend a good 6S 30x30 FC, uh, that will work with, with your Mamba ESC? So I don't know anything about the Mamba ESC, but what I do know is that as long as it has a plug header which looks like that for anyone that's new that's a plug header and on ESC's as long as they have this plug header that means that they also that they send the um, they send power and the motor signals out of that so as long as that ESC has a plug header Flight controller doesn't matter. My recommendation down in the description, uh, the, my, my preferred 30 by 30 flight controller is the CL Racing. Uh, CL Racing is who makes the Talons, the Talon flight controllers, um, which I didn't know until very recently. Uh, so yeah, CL Racing, in my opinion, is really on top of the game. They, they've been making flight controllers for longer than pretty much anybody, I believe. And... Uh, yeah, I've, I've, you know, it's interesting, like, I've, I've never heard somebody say I, that they blew up a CL Racing flight controller. I'm sure they have, um, but I've never heard that, and that's always a good sign. So, there you go. Uh, there was something else that I wanted to add to one of the questions. God damn it. Um, and it was somewhat important. Uh, God, Kentek, you did tag me on one of the other ones. Um... Damn it. I forgot what it was. Maybe I'll think of it. Uh, Lost Johnny mentions uh, stainless steel hardware. Uh, if you're talking about the screws, absolutely. Uh, if you're talking about the standoffs, no, 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 no. They're so heavy. So I, I bought uh, a bag of these 20 mil uh, tall standoffs in stainless and in aluminum. And for eight of them, for a regular five inch rig, it was like, it was almost 30 grams, I think. They were so fucking heavy. Uh, get the aluminum ones. The, the aluminum ones were like eight or six grams or something like that. Uh, but for the screws, totally. Stainless steel uh, screws, I absolutely recommend. You can tell because they'll usually say 12.9, I believe, on them. 
There's ones that'll say 12.9. There's there's ones that'll say 10 point something or other. Real, real, real tiny on the head of the screw. Um, yeah, those are the ones you want. So, yeah, that's my recommendation there. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Supercell is asking which target to flash for the Talon F7, Seal Racing F7. Uh, do the do the Talon F7 one. Yeah, the Seal Racing F7 one is for their 30 by 30 board. Definitely do the, the Talon F7 um, target. That's the one that... Uh, he also says Seal Racing F7 target. That's interesting. Um... I, I, I'm not going to say give it a try because if, because you can brick it. Um, so yeah, I would stick with the Talon one in fear of bricking the damn thing. Uh, okay. One last one from Travis. Travis is glad he could finally make it to a live stream. I'm glad you could too, Travis. Welcome. Okay. Another video from Nicholas Gallard. Let's pick a good one. What do you say? I want to ditch my audio that quick. Uh, oh, anamorphic. That's cool. Alpine stroll. Bubbly summers from a year ago. I don't want to go too far back. Uh, let's go alpine stroll. Let's see what's going on with that. Killing my mic. That was pretty gnarly at the end there. Holy crap, that, uh, 
Is that a mountain goat? Big ass horns. I don't think it's a goat. That's, uh, damn. That's pretty gnarly. Oh, yeah, link to his channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be important so that you guys can actually watch him, right? Here comes the Strange Family. Look at that URL. Um, damn it, I wish I remembered how to get... Um, I dealt with the same thing with Motor 4 on that. I wish I could... Um, yeah, Cantec, right. Um, good thinking. I usually this is, I do this every time. I forget to uh, to give you guys the uh, the link, but yeah, that this dude is is gnarly. The long range stuff is so cool. Um, I cannot wait to move to Oregon. Um, it's probably going to be a couple years, but because that's that's going to be like long range heaven. Um, I could probably do some of it here in the Appalachian Mountains, but it's like an hour out, uh, so it's kind of a pain in the ass. But whatever. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to a 3-inch prop discussion because there have been a whole bunch of new 3-inch props and uh, I can I can comment on their durability. Oh, you know what? No, you know what I do? I'm going to hook this up and I'm going to look because this has a whoo, this has a Talon F7 in it and we're going to see what the target is. So before you guys flash firmware, always go into the CLI and type version. If you type the word version, although actually now um, Betaflight puts it in the top left corner, uh, what the target is. But uh, if you're on an older version of Betaflight or something ships with an older version, go to the CLI, type the word version, and it'll tell you the version of uh, Betaflight it's on and the, um, the target. So, real quick, let's look at this. Oh, I'm tired. I slept like shit this weekend. Um, target, Talon F7 V2. There it is. Yeah, so, and, so I always do that. I always look at it before I flash it, so that means that it ships with the Talon F7 V2 uh, target. As much as I would think that those two targets are the same, if you haven't tried to get around the Motor 4 problems on the, the Talon F7 V2 target, I would I would try that. Uh, okay. Super chat from Travis Easterby. Thank you, brother. $3.99, and he's got the cool little sticker thing that uh, somebody did last week, and I asked them how they did it, and they didn't respond. Um, Travis said... It's a sticker, I think. Where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is it? There it is. Uh, there are now super chats and super stickers. Each sticker sticker costs a different price. That's cool. All right, yeah, that's neat. I can dig. So let's dive into some three-inch props because I'm sure that's very relevant to everybody's interests. Uh, to preface this. The reason why I put a lot of emphasis on props with micros, no shit, Super. Brand new, it said CL Racing F7. That's weird. That's very weird. Huh. Um, okay. The reason why I put such emphasis on propellers uh, with, um, well, I mean, in general, with 5-inch rigs too. With 5-inch rigs, propellers aren't like horribly imbalanced like they can be on uh, micros, but... Propellers make a huge difference in, in everything. The dynamics of the quad, top to bottom, the propellers have a huge impact. So I always recommend that you guys buy lots and lots of different propellers. Every single order you do, just pick up a rando set of propellers because you might love them. Uh, with micros, it's even more important because a lot of the, the micro propellers are not balanced well. And we already have enough problems getting these things to fly right. Um, the last thing that we need is uh, imbalanced uh, propellers. You beat me to it, Jay. We're, those are in my stack that I'm going to show. Uh, you know what? Let's weigh them, too. Uh, the weight of the propeller is also really important. Uh, the lighter the propeller, the lighter the rotating mass, and the quicker the motor is going to be able to speed up and slow down uh, the, the whole rotating mass, the quicker it can do that the easier it, it'll handle prop wash. 
Um, think of it this way: the the pid loop, the pid loop, pid loop, pid loop is running at at least a thousand uh, per second per minute. I don't know. The the error correction loop is running at horrendously high speeds. Um, way, 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 way faster than any motor could ever speed up and slow down a propeller. Um, so every single fraction of a gram that you can remove uh, from a propeller, from the propeller or the uh, the motor bell, uh, is hugely important and makes a big difference in that it, it being able to speed it up and slow it down. Uh, so yeah, those are two of the big things. But the in in Microprops being imbalanced is a real fucking problem, and it it really pisses me off. Uh, because for a time, for a long time actually, um, you couldn't you couldn't fly micros on some of these props. Like you would you'd build a micro, and you'd put one of these imbalanced props on it, and regardless of how low you dumped the pid tune, it just it would just fly away every time. And like lots of people got super pissed and just bailed on uh, micros because of that. Now with the RPM filtering and and the, the, the props are getting better, uh, that's not such an issue, but it still definitely makes a difference. So we're gonna, I got a whole bunch of the new three inch props. We're just gonna blast through all of them. I haven't flown many of them, uh, but we can look at how durable they are roughly and we can weigh them. So we're gonna start with the Shit, is it gem? I think it's gem fan. Uh, thirty sixteen. Thirty sixteen. I th yeah, yeah. Thirty sixteen. Gem fan thirty sixteen. This is a very lightweight, uh, kind of flimsy ish prop. Uh, kebab worked uh, to have this made for the toothpick stuff. So you would probably not want to put this on an acrobat. It would probably spin it so hard that it would flatten it out, uh, and you probably wouldn't be able to put enough RPM into it. This is a, to, to make a bunch of thrust with this, you're gonna have to spin the hell out of it uh, because it's very low pitch. But then when you spin the hell out of this, it's so thin that it's gonna flatten out uh, or it's going to um, start to blob up and down. <laughs> What's the name for it? Um, it sounds like a goose. It goes, Arr! like, like you'll, you'll add throttle and then all of a sudden it'll go, Arr! And that's the, the propeller blade deflecting. Deflecting, that's the word. Um, it's deflecting up and down. Getting all angry. So, yeah, lightweight rigs only for this. It's going to be very light, I'm sure. So I'm going to do all the T-mount props first. T-mount is the uh, are the ones with the three holes. So let's give that a second to equalize. Okay, while it's going, it says 1.2. Let's give it another second. Getting these together. Here's the other one that I'm excited about. All right, 1.2. Like I said, very lightweight. 1.2. Uh, this, I'm going to run on this little guy, 180 grams all up with 4,000 kV, 1304s on 4S. Um, I wish these, I'll probably end up swapping these out for the 5,000 kVs, but I'm, um, there's a, it might not need that much RPM. It, it, it's gonna be a little experiment to see how much RPM a three inch prop really does need. Uh, so yeah, that'll be cool. Flutter, that's another word for it. Yeah, 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 Doc Murdoch. Yep, it flutters and it just boop. Like I said, sounds like a goose. First time it happens to you, you'll be like, oh, he was right. Sounds exactly like a goose. It honks, it's a goose honk. Uh, here are the Emacs Avan three inch. So, there is a caveat to this prop, which is that. Let me go. Uh, let me go macro. They made the inside of the prop extend way below the the mounting base. So there are a number of motors that these won't work on. Um, they, they literally will not fit on the motor because the bell is uh, too wide. The RCX 1304s have a bell that, let's see if I can get it, you see there? It's, it's, it's got a bell that does that nice 45 degree angle. So this prop does work because 
they clear it. But like, look how close that is. Hold on, let me go macro again. So like this motor is almost like perfectly meant for this, but look how close it still is, right? Um, Tommy's uh, 1407s, the Brat motors, the the top of that can, the top of that bell is flat. It's not at, at this 45 degree angle. And uh, these won't go on there. They, you just cannot uh, run them, period. There's no way to fix that. Uh, so you gotta be careful with these. Other than that, I love these. Uh, well, the durability is actually also a problem, um, but these are great. They are lower pitch than they look. Uh, they make them in gray, which is awesome, and they just have a really good feel to them. They're very, very well balanced. Emacs Avon props are incredibly well balanced. I don't know why, but all the Emacs Avon props have always been very well balanced. I am shocked. This is also 1.2 grams. How the hell is that possible? Look at the difference. Huh. So, this is the big problem with these. And I, I now know why these are both 1.2 grams. All right, so this guy basically has either more plastic in the, in the blade or uh, they're using a higher density plastic. Because when you do this, it snaps back pretty quick. Now you guys are going ham in that chat. Let me. I gotta. I'm gonna get caught up in the chat in a second. Um, this pops right back up, and it feels relatively durable, like a little gummy maybe. Look at this though. And this is the problem I have with these props. See how far down it? Like I'm. I'm putting roughly the same amount of force on it. And it just bends way down. So, but what's weird is in here, it's very stout. Like, you'll never bend an entire one of these props down. You'll bend just, like, the middle. And that's what happens. Like, right around here, like, a third of the way out the blade, it'll just crease. And um, it's it'll never be the same again. You, you can straighten that crease out, um, but it'll always be a little bit imbalanced and, and wobble a little bit. But, yeah, that's my problem with these is that they're just too fragile. I mean, look at that. Like, on one hand, that's kind of cool because you do want some flexibility, but that's too much that is is a little bit too flexible um which is strange because their two and a half and their two inch props are like the complete opposite they're super 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 tough all the way out to the end of the blade um so these are like some weirdo anomaly i'm really hoping that they make a new version of their three inch props that are scimitar ish um that have that stronger blade profile to them like the two and a half inch blurs and the two inch eh, I forget what they call them but two and a half and two inches are great props these are great if you don't crash a lot if you do crash a lot you're gonna get very frustrated uh, okay next up is okay no hold on uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, my chat is like bright orange from you guys tagging me thank you uh, all right with the Talon F7 V2 flash and the CLI from the site, it still gets no motor for God damn it. Um, what's the resource for your... T yeah, that's that's a good idea. Let me plug this back in, and I'll grab the uh, resource part of the dump and send it to you. Uh, hmm. There's a chance this won't work because there's a chance I fix the problem by moving the motor four wire to the LED pad. I did that on one of these rigs. Uh, I can actually, s I can probably see if I did it um, on this one. I'll just get a little light out here. So yeah, I was having that problem and on one rig, my solution was just to move that motor four wire. And yeah, this is this is the one I did that on. Um, yeah, that was annoying to have to do that. And I think after I did it, I figured it out. But this was like two months ago, and I can't remember two weeks ago. So, um, shit. Type in, um, go to Google, type in Talon F7 
motor four. And that that might be what I did to solve it. Talon F4 motor four, and, uh, and you'll find, I think you'll find some, some info on it. Uh, Cantec is about to head out. Thanks for coming. See you next week, hopefully. Uh, Doc Murdoch, <laughs> yeah, that usually happens before catastrophic failure, absolutely. Um, Supercell website says official BF target Talon F7 V2 in the manual number 23 at the bottom of the picture uh, says to use CL Racing F7. That's really weird. Very, very strange. Oh, we're, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, right. Remap motor 4 to the LED pad. That That's how I fixed it. But there has to be a way to, to, to leave it on the... Um, there has to be a way. has to be a way. I'll uh, I'll figure it out tonight or tomorrow. One more. No, no, no. We're doing. Whew, it's a close one. So, I'm really excited by these. HQ makes the most durable props, uh, other than the two inch. Oh my god! The two inch, two and a half inch Emacs. Uh, blur and whatever the other one's called. A lot of HQ props are not well balanced. Um, they're balanced okay, but they're not balanced as good as gem fan props. And what happens for me is I'll have gem fan props. Um, I'll get my tune to like the limits of a, of a nice, well balanced gem fan prop, and then I'll put an HQ prop on it, and as soon as Iron Motor will fly away. Um, that's kind of how I know that they're not as well balanced. Um, that's a cool question, Nick. I'll hit that in a second. So, but the S3s were very well balanced. S3s are the first 5-inch uh, HQ props that were good enough, that were balanced well enough where I could run my pretty aggressive tune on them and not have issues. I hope that they're doing the same thing on these micro props. These are three by two and a half by three. Um, what the tip off, I'm hoping, is that they're gray. Um, the S5s they made in this same gray. Not to mention that gray micro, all the micro props should be gray because we get, we always get props in view. Um, and neutral gray is the color that will disappear the best, even better than clear. Clear creates a whole bunch of reflections that for some reason, um, Neutral gray doesn't seem to. So, yeah, these are two and a half pitch. HQ's props are also usually very pitchy, and they also do perform in a way that... Um, so there's no real control or standard for pitch. It, it doesn't feel like in this industry. So, like, I'll get a, an HQ prop that's 35 pitch, and like it'll hammer as hard as as a gem fan prop that's like 42 pitch or something like that. So the pitch numbers can be very deceiving if you're going to compare them cross manufacturer. So when I'm looking at these as a 2.5 pitch, I'm only going to be able to compare that to the other HQ props and I'll be able to say, "Okay, this is less pitch than HQ's 3x3x3." Three by three by three. Does that make sense? Um I have high hopes for these. They they have this HQ plastic, which is very durable. Um, they are pretty thin and light. Uh, I wish they didn't do that. I wish they weren't quite that flexible. So my hunch is that these are going to do the same thing that the three-inch Avans do. Maybe not, uh, but my hunch is going to be that they crease in the middle of the blade when you crash them hard. I'll also bet that they're. I bet you that they're 1.2 grams. Nah, they'll be a little bit more. They'll be a little bit heavier than 1.2. Let's give that a second. I'll get the next ones out, which are no surprise to you guys. Not bad, 1.3. Give it another second. Sometimes it'll add another 0.1 as it sits here for a while. Sometimes I have to do that to... Yeah, now it's at 1.4. So it's between 1.3 and 1.4. Um, high hopes. Haven't run them yet. Can't wait to run them. What's up, Brad? Brad McManus in the house, McManus FPV, everybody his channel, awesome pilot, great human being, um, yeah, best friend of mine for the last 20 or so years, and uh, we are on this FPV adventure together. We talk pretty much every day, and 
a lot of what I know is because of him, and we push each other, and uh, it's awesome. We live hundreds and hundreds of we live almost a thousand miles away, but we don't let that stop us. So do it. Uh, this is the Gem Fan Thirty Twenty Eight. Why do I always forget? Thirty Twenty Eight. Up until now, well, still, this is my favorite three-inch prop. Uh, one of the things I love the most about it is, in its current form, it will fit an M5 nut, and they give you these little inserts that you would think are, like, the worst thing in the world. I mean, they're not the best thing in the world. Like, they are kind of a pain in the ass to get on. Um, the easy way of getting them on is to put the little widget thing on the motor and then take the prop and just push it down onto it and when you do that the, here's the thing to remember though uh, the little widget centerpiece see how it's not going in this little centerpiece is uh, tapered so if it doesn't go in take it off spin it and put it back on and now usually it will go right on see and that went right on in that direction and I guess they did that to, to make sure it really locks in here, which it does. I've never had one of these fail. Um, so now it's a T-mount. See the three little holes there? Very, very cool. Emacs is now doing the same thing. Uh, I hope everybody does the same thing because at some point you, like, you're not going to have all micros on T-mount motors. At some point you're going to get T-motors that are M5 nut and to have to run a totally different prop, that sucks. Uh, having these, I can run the same exact props regardless of the motor on all the micro rigs, so that's a good thing. Um, this is not the most durable prop, it's also not the most fragile, it's more durable than the Avan 3 inch, uh, and 28 pitch is a really good pitch. Gemfan makes beautifully balanced props, this is no uh, exception to that, and just flies really good. It's just a, it, it's a prop that just feels right. And it weighs, Get the next ones ready. It weighs 1.5. That's uh, to be expected. The blades are a little bit wider. And uh, yeah, that's dope. So yeah, it's still sitting at 1.5. And I, I kind of preloaded the, uh, the scale on that one. So awesome props. But these HQ props might replace these. If these are more durable than these and they're still well balanced, I will switch over to these. Um, if nothing else, because these are in neutral gray and these are not. Um, the clear of these is just not as good as neutral gray um, when you have props in view. And I'm now getting to the point where all of my micros are on HD and I don't want props in view. Next, we're gonna go off the reservation with um, the new Avan Scimitars, which are a three and a half uh, uh, inch prop. I don't know what, I think you have to run these on four inch frames. I, I got these because I thought that, so the, the Acrobrat has um, some, half, some good clearance between the prop tips and the, uh, and the body. And I thought that I'd just be able to squeeze them in there uh, but I was very wrong. Like it's it's not even close. Like it, it hits it hits real hard. Um, so I don't know if I'll ever run these on anything until at least until I get a, a four inch frame. But um, very cool prop. This is the profile that I want them to make a three inch prop in. Emacs, please please, um, because it's it's really durable. Like listen to that snap, man. It just snaps back into place. Um, this blade profile is very, very strong and flies really, really well. So, uh, I, I was really hoping that the, uh, that the Acrobat was, was going to clear these. Um, at some point we will be doing, uh, I should say Rotorius will be doing four inch arms for the CB, for the removal arm, uh, CB frame which is now going to be called the Ripper Frame. And I'll totally do this on those. That'll be really cool. Um, I have no idea, Brad. I have absolutely no idea why they made a 3.5 inch prop. Um, they must have had a reason, because molds ain't cheap. 
Uh, my guess would be it has to do with one of their one of their uh, racing rigs. Um, they've got all those wacky uh, Hawk Five and, and all those racing rigs. I, I guess they have one that can swing a little bit bigger of a prop. So that brings us to the end of the T-mount props. Um, now we'll talk about M5 nut props. Of course, the um, these two with the little inserts, they also run, excuse me, on M5. But what's happening? There's a whole bunch of props that are uh, M5 specific that have the great big hole. Uh, and these are the first ones that we'll talk about. These are the HQ 2.9 by 2.9 by 4. Uh, quad blade props are much less efficient. I didn't think it would be such a difference in efficiency, but it is. The trade-off for that, it well, so the, the efficiency loss is because the tips of the blades are closer together um, versus a three blade you have more distance um, between the tips of the blades. And the reason why that matters is um, wings or propeller blades or pretty much anything that creates high pressure on one side and low pressure on the other, uh, the, the most turbulent part is on the outside because that's where all this air that's stacked up is able to escape. Um, so most blades or wings make dirty it will all make dirty air on the on the very outside tip so if you've got dirty air coming off this four blade tip this next blade is coming into that dirty air a lot sooner than a three blade prop right you have this whole distance i know it doesn't look like much but it, it it's a big difference um so on a three blade you've got more time for that turbulence to disperse um so that this next prop comes around into air that's more clean uh, so it's work the general consensus um, just as Danny just mentioned actually is that three blade is the sweet spot two blade is the other end of the spectrum it's more efficient but the problem with two blades is they rotate out of the way when your motor hits so you got you got your two blade like this right as soon as the the rig hits the ground the even if there's a blade straight down it's gonna rotate out of the way and then the motor bell is going to bang directly into the concrete. And that's a really good way to kill a lot of motors. Uh, whereas a three blade, the, the propeller is always, 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 always going to hit first. And if it's a hard hit, it's going to push right through it into the motor bell. But it at least gives it a little tiny bit of deceleration. Um, specifically if you hit it like this. Like if it hits perfectly sideways like this it's going to have to really jam to, to push through these blades into the into the bell. Um, so, yeah, three blades gives you the protection, but better efficiency. And that's why most people run them. But Tommy uh, has been experimenting with four blades. So he had HQ make these. Uh, the, the pro to the four blades is grip. Since you have more blade surface, when you rotate the rig around to change directions um, the the additional blade surface will just it just makes it drive into the corner harder um, it's very hard to put it into words but when you fly it you'll know it like especially if you cross coordinate a lot so when when you cross coordinate um, which makes it corner like this and it makes the the video look like it's on a gimbal because the whole point of cross coordinating is to is for your horizon to stay level when you fly like that, it slides a bunch, especially on like two or three blades. Like you'll you'll rotate it around, and you'll just keep sliding this way. And you're like the center of your um, your view is not where you're going forward. You got to kind of shift your eyes over and and wait for it to to equalize, and then start driving in the correct direction again. Um, the four blades do a better job of minimizing that amount of time. You turn it like that, and it really just uh, starts to, to actually change direction uh, a good amount quicker. So that's the point of four blades. Props are cheap. Buy them, run them, see if you like them. If you don't, you only wasted three bucks. Uh, and they're also going to be heavier. That's that's a definite ding. There's a lot of dings on four blade props. Um, there's a lot of reasons not to run four blades, but props are cheap. Try them out. 1.7, 1.8, 1.8 grams. So yeah quite an increase in weight 
But very interesting props to fly. Uh, if you, these might be really, the cinematic stuff might move towards these because being able to, to fly with less tilt um, open some doors so there, there's there's a chance that for not long range uh, cinematic stuff that the four blades might become a thing so we'll see next up is I'm gonna save the two brand new ones to me for last next up is uh, HQ's 3 by 3 by 3 there is only one site that I know of to get these and it is RDQ they are um, HQ's old school, like V1S blade profile, blade shape, uh, which is still relevant. Um, it, there are some newer blade profiles that are better, but these are very, very tough. Um, these are probably, no, not anymore. These were the toughest three inch uh, uh, prop that you could get. Uh, they're not. The balance, the balance is okay. It's not great. Uh, these are the props that I would put on the Acrobrat and I would have to back my tune off a little bit from the gem fans. But a really good all-arounder. Really, you kind of can't go wrong with these. Um, although the T-Motor props coming up, I think kind of blow these away. Uh, these are technically lower pitch, right? Three. These are a three pitch and these T-Motors coming up are a four pitch. But like I said, between brands, you can't really compare pitch numbers. You have to fly and be able to feel that. Uh, 1.5 grams. So fairly light, too. I didn't realize. I, I thought these would be heavier than that. Um, great all-around prop to just have in your bag at all times. Because uh, now, now that it's getting colder, the, the durability of the prop changes. In the cold, uh, the, the durability goes out the fucking window, quite honestly. Um, and everything becomes fragile as shit. This is the 3x4x3. Uh, this is the most pitchy prop that I will run on a micro. Uh, again, it, this this performs a lot like the Gemfan 52 pitch prop. To give you some idea of how, raw, how off these pitch numbers can be between brands. Uh, 1.6 grams. Again, very durable. These are even more durable. Uh, than the lower pitch props that happens all the time I think it's because when you add more pitch you have to beef up the uh, the hub of the prop and that makes it more durable um, and yeah great props they're a little little too pitchy but if, if you want to go real fast they might be a good choice for you and they're durable as hell last set of HQ props we're going to do are these Cinewoop specific ones these are oh they don't give you the um they don't give you the the pitch form uh they just say cinewoop 3. so a couple of the companies are making cinewoop specific props now and this is one of them uh they are all pretty much bullnose because a bullnose prop for uh i guess because you want to get as as much of the tip of the prop as close as you can to the ducts um yeah that's that's why so uh, what I also know about bullnose is that it makes the prop perform like it's longer but it's also shit for efficiency um, but I'm, I'm really interested to see how these perform on uh, without ducts because in theory they should perform like a 3.2 or 3.3 inch I think they're heavy though yeah Jesus 1.9, 2.0, 2 grams of prop, that's heavy. Uh, but they're meant for Cinewoops, which are running like 1507s, so that won't be much of an issue. They also feel very durable. Oh, God, yeah. Wow. So I'm pushing hard on that. If I push this hard on any of those lighter props, it would be like bent in a 180, um, like what I was doing before. So yeah, super interesting. Got them just for the sake of them being three bucks. Hope I like them. Last set of props are the mind-blowing T-Motor 3140s. Big burly bastard. Um, big old blade. 
extremely durable. Um, I'm. That's as hard as I, that's it. That that was it. That was full McGillicuddy, um, and it didn't even like it didn't even permanently bend it. It's I think it's gonna be a little heavy, but my God, have I been waiting for a durable prop? Um, and I was blown away the other day by how durable these was. These were. Um, so let me see what it weighs. Not as bad as I thought. Oh. Just as bad as I thought. Two grams. That's a heavy prop. Um, that's a heavy prop, but the 1606s that I have on the Acrobrat are big, burly motherfuckers. They are, they are something else. Um, and they have no trouble spinning these things up and down. That being said, removing rotational weight, regardless of, oh, the motor can handle it, doesn't matter. Removing rotational weight makes it better, period. No questions asked. The only thing that gets worse is durability. So these are super interesting. I love the idea of a very durable prop. And so if you guys didn't know, T-Motor props are made by GemFan. So T-Motor props are beautifully, um, beautifully well balanced. Danny Mars, I, I'm glad that I saw it. Uh, I haven't mentioned it in a while. If you guys want me to see a comment, because there's a bunch, uh, do at CIDFPV, and that lights the comment up in orange for me. Um, but I just happened to see Danny's, and Danny is an extremely helpful, extremely smart um, guy that knows a lot about uh, black box and tuning and all kinds of good shit. So King of Micros, he says, uh, did you text the text? Did you test the Emacs Tiny Hawk Freestyle yet? Uh, he tested it this week, and damn it flies so good. It's super locked in. Um, I have not, but the that that quad is basically a toothpick with a, a little bit heavier of a frame. And Bob, uh, Kebab did a hell of a job figuring out the um, the weight to... So it's what we were talking about before. There's a ratio of... Uh, I'm sorry, there's a combination of... All up weight, motor size, prop size, uh, voltage. There, there are combinations of those four things that fly really fucking good. Um, and if you get, unfortunately, if you get one of those wrong, it's it's a slippery slope. Like it, it gets real bad in a hurry. That rig has the correct voltage, uh, the correct. It's a little little too heavy. The all up weight is a little bit heavy compared to the the actual toothpicks. Uh, but that's okay. It's got the properly sized motor for the prop. That That's why that thing flies so good. It's got a motor that has enough torque to spin up and slow down that prop um, quickly enough that it just it locks in. And, and it's got uh, enough of a... It's, it's called response time. Um, although I guess response time is more referring to sticks to, to glass. Um, the amount of time between you putting a, a set point input in and it going through the whole system and then coming back up into your eyeballs through the through the goggles. So I guess it's not technically called response time, but I'm sure you guys know what I'm saying. The the how quick it can spin up and slow down the uh, the propeller. So yeah, when when rigs get that right, micros fly unbelievable and. Um, this is one of the th reasons why I just keep pushing you guys to the Patreon, um, or I guess it's down here, because I have those setups. I just made this post with those setups, and uh, I it'll blow your mind how good a micro can fly when it's got that right combination. So, that's the end of Prop Talk. It is 5.30. Uh... Let's tear the Acrobat down as fast as we can which will be quick. It's always so quick to rip stuff apart. Um, I have to get to the ESC, so the whole thing has to come down. Uh, let me get the light set up, working a little bit better over here, and then I'll move the camera, and we will rip this apart, and then I'm going to call it because our uh, white Christmas tree just showed up, and I want to put it together because Chris and I have not had a Christmas tree Ever? 
Never. Wow. We've been together for 13, 14 years. We've been living together for half of that. Yeah. And we've never had a Christmas tree. Weirdly, we've always lived in places where, like, there was not a good spot for a Christmas tree. Like, I don't know, it's, it's been weird. But now, this place has a good spot right in front of the, uh, the door that goes out to the patio. Do you need more water? Nope, I'm good. <clears throat> um, okay, got to move this camera for you guys. And we are going to speed run a uh, Acrobrat disassembly. Which will kind of be interesting. I'm uh, very curious how quick I can do this without being sloppy. All right, so let's get this out of here. And all right, let me get the uh, focus off of manual. Oh, I gotta bring the mic over too. Sean, uh, this is I can't find it anymore. I can't find. I I want to add. One of these lights, this actually also has a magnifying glass in it, um, which I find completely useless. But uh, McManus in the chat will tell you that he uses it all the time. Um, so I, I, I assume that some people will, will like that. I prefer a, uh, a little 5X loop when I need to see closer. Um, this, for me, is just a light source. And I really want to add this to my list of uh, stuff in the description because having a light source that you can do this with and move around like this, holy hell does it make a difference. Like, it, it, it just makes it so much easier to work on these goddamn tiny little bastards with all these little corners and you always kind of have to look in there. Is that wire kind of hanging up? And like, ugh, it's just brutal. So, um, yeah, I got to find one of these to put on my list. Um, I, when I put stuff on the list, I also try to make sure it's like either the cheapest or the best or, or a combination of the two. I don't just randomly grab some and say, hey guys, you buy this. Like I, I, I read a shitload of the reviews and probably spend more time than I need to, but um, I don't want you guys to get garbage. And, uh, but yeah, I can't, I can't find this exact one. So I gotta go digging around. I um, there's a show on Netflix called what's that fix it show called? Uh, repair the repair shop. Um, repair shop on Netflix. It, it's a a bunch of old fogies. That, uh, I'm not gonna be able to say that for much longer. <laughs> um, that repair like wacky stuff, clocks and. Uh, benches and oh, like family heirlooms that people love and are willing to spend money on and every single one of the um, super accomplished total ninja repair people on that show have one of these but it's just a light and it's really wide it's like it's probably like this doesn't mean much to you guys but it's probably like this wide whereas this thing is is more like this this round and i would actually rather have that so I'm, i am going to sort of look around for that but um brad is uh mcmenis is very he takes a very hard line on how much he uses the magnifying glass and he is just as smart of a dude as me so that means that i'm the weirdo <laughs> and quite quite honestly this thing, like, just having this is, is totally, like, in a perfect world, right, now that I've figured out that I don't use the uh, the magnifying glass on this, um, in a perfect world, I'd go back in time and buy one of the long ones rather than the round ones, but there's absolutely no reason to do that because this is probably just as good as, as, the, as the wide one. Um, that's a great show, too. You guys should watch that if you have Netflix, uh, The Repair Shop. It's really, really cool. Um, it's a bunch of, like, total ninjas that have been you know repairing clocks for 700 years and and uh the the one woman does uh ceramic repairs i mean it's it's just crazy and it, it's over in britain so it's it's kind of perfect since they're not as much they're not nearly as much of a throwaway culture as we are um so yeah check it out i see a couple of tags Explosive Fruits asking if I'm thinking of building an Acrobrat Duo. Absolutely. 
Uh, I've been waiting on the prototype um, because, no, well, actually I can't say why, but I've been waiting on the prototype if, and I have this V1, which is totally fine. The V2 is a little bit stronger, uh, subtle improvements, but really good improvements. Yeah, if, if it's, I, I want to build the second Acrobrat because um, with the RPM filters, this has become a very viable uh, Cinewoop platform. Maybe even a better Cinewoop platform than our existing Cinewoops because it's a lot lighter than the Shen Drones frame. Uh, it also has the clean, dirty setup, which can't hurt. Literally, it cannot hurt. It can only make the, the, the footage uh, smoother. And... I guess that's it. I guess those are really the two, the two big reasons. Um, but yeah, if if it's gonna turn into that, it, at some point I do, uh, and I am planning on uh, getting involved in the in the cinema side of FPV and uh, possibly trying to make a living from it. Uh, the limiting factor is that. The TV studios and just basically the people that make, um, the people that actually have money, right? Let's just say that Fox, CBS, um, they have not realized the value of FPV drones yet. Uh, but when they do, I think that there's going to be a run on, I hope that there's going to be a run on FPV pilots and. I have been working my ass off to get my piloting skills to a point where I would hopefully be on some sort of a short list for that uh, and be able to fly for money. The only thing that I worry about that is that uh, when I tried to do that with photography I and videography actually, fresh out of college, I drove it in the ground and I never wanted to do it ever again. Uh, I've taken enough time off of photography where I don't hate it anymore, but burnout is real. And as soon as you turn something that is only for fun into something that feeds your family, things change. And uh, I don't want to let that happen. So it's the kind of thing where like I, I've been through it enough where now... I know what the warning signs are, and uh, yeah, yeah. So here it is. Let me uh, let me show you this super. This is how I fix that problem on this one. I took the um, hold on. Let me get some light. I took the one motor signal wire. See the little white one sitting right next to the uh, plug header. Yeah, that's what I did. I took the one. Out of, the, uh, out of the plug header here, you can see there's only three, one, two, three, and I put it on that little pad there, and I'm pretty sure that's the LED pad. Yeah, it's the LED pad. So it's kind of cool that they put that LED pad right there because it's, it's really not hard to do that, but there's gotta be a way to not do that because at some point, that'll be a pain in the ass. Oh, right now this is gonna be a pain in the ass because I have to remove the ESC, and if, the if the GS25 doesn't have the exact same pinout, I'm gonna have to desolder that, and yeah, it'll be a pain. Not the end of the world, of course, but uh, Brad, what were you talking about when you tagged me and said the one I linked is super close? Oh, 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 awesome, awesome, yeah. Uh, did you, I'm assuming you read a, uh, a bunch of reviews on that one, Brad, and, and we can, uh, we can confidently recommend it. Uh, Super says, make sure I'm on your list if they need someone else. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if that ever becomes a thing, then you never know, guys. Keep flying, keep getting better, and uh, yeah, who the hell knows? 
I, I, I truly do think, though, that there is... Um, yeah, that, that once they... And I think we're pretty close, actually. Um, Steel gets a lot of professional work, uh, as does Kevin, as does Tommy. Uh, who else? Martin from Fly Life. Um, Nurk, obviously. So, like, it's happening. And, and two years ago, that was not the case. Uh, so, I don't know. He can, he can cry, that's fine. The people like to hear the cat cry. Took his box away. He's upset. Oh, Kristen took his uh, his box away, and now he's upset. Uh, do I need to bring the cat on the stream for you guys? Is that the deal? Why am I? I'm doing this opposite. <clears throat> Workbench is soft focused. All right, hold up. There we go. Thank you for that. Um. What else do we have? Yeah, I run this uh, Logitech webcam on uh, manual focus because the autofocus sucks a big bag of dicks. Uh, so I just do it manual focus, which is fine for me because I did photography for a long time with digital SLRs where... The second the autofocus isn't perfect, you just spin the ring on the front and manually focus it. Um, that sucks, Ben. Yeah, it's uh, it is a tough sell at the moment, unfortunately. But it'll change. I think it'll change. I hope it changes. I don't know if there'll be enough work for all of us, but if, uh, I don't know, words, 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 words. So all I need to do is pull the ESC out, eh? Um, so now this plug header is totally useless because one of the motor signal wires is hard soldered. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I keep saying there has to be a way to get the F7 to work without doing that. But... As long as you leave a little bit of extra length on your wires in here, um, yeah, it's not the end of the world. Not the end of the world. What time is it? If it hits 6 o'clock, I'm going to bail. 5.47. It's not too bad. Let's keep going. We'll go a little bit more. And uh, hit me with those last-minute questions because... Max, I'm out of here in 13 minutes. Explosive Fruit says, what grommets to use for the frame? I put the blue ones in. Um, put the blue ones in as the temp will soften them up. Uh, I run all whites all the time because the until the, the white ones start maxing out and running all the way to the end of their travel, then they're the, white, the, they're the right ones to run. And in the dead of summer here in Atlanta, they were not maxing out. Um, if they were to max out, in theory, you'll see it in the um, in the footage. Basically, you'll get it'll it'll spike the gyro, and uh, you'll get a little like twitch because the it's at that point it's like bad data, right? If if you soft mount and you don't hit the ends of it. Um, all it's doing is, is like lowering, lowering the, uh, lowering the peaks, right? So if, if, if a vibration was spiking to like, let's say 2G, right? A hard mounted. If you soft mount it, it's going to spread the amount of time out that that spike happens and the spike's going to become lower. Uh, so maybe it, it would only spike to like one and a half G. Uh, and that helps the, the gyros out a lot. But if you max that soft mounting out and it hits a hard stop, then you get a huge G spike uh, that's basically bad data, and that's no good. What's cool about rubber is, um, or silicone, or whatever the hell these are made of, uh, when rubber gets to its absolute limit, it doesn't go like that. It, it doesn't like max and then slam a brick wall. 
it it, it just keeps comp- like soft, 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 harder, 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 right? Like it, it unless you unless you cut it, um, unless you hit it so hard that you cut it and the carbon cuts through the rubber and hits uh, the carbon on the bottom plate, you'll never get a full blown um, gyro spike, G spike, I should say. So yeah, that's why I run the white ones. Uh, to, uh, and, and also, to be honest with you guys, I tried the white ones and then I tried the black ones, which are complete opposite ends of the spectrum, and I didn't see any real difference. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the white ones don't cause any problems, so I'm going to keep running them. <laughs> For science. All right, I think I saw one more comment. I just want to loosen these up before I read it. Okay. House blog is managing to get some work done. Oh, yeah, I am. Yeah, right. It's, it's pretty rare. I usually just go on rants the entire time, scream and yell. <laughs> um, all right, and that was the grommet question. Cool. Budget just like spring rate. So that's um, spring rate is a perfect analog for what I was just talking about. Um, a coil spring has a stopping point. There is a point where a coil spring will hit and um, will hit metal on metal. And uh, that is one of the things that can, that is possibly the worst thing to happen uh, in motorsports when you are going really fast in a corner. Because basically what, what we call that is infinite spring rate in, in the motorsports world. Um, and it, it only happens when you're either running old bump stops or no bump stops. The, the bump stop in, in your suspension, every single car, uh, has bump stops built into the suspension. Well, I guess some of the hyper cars don't, but whatever, they don't count. Um, every single other car has bump stops and that's exactly why, because the manufacturers know that if you max out that spring rate, and you fully compress that spring, all the energy that's left instantaneously transfers to the chassis of the car, which not only is going to make the car jump up in the air, but it's going to stress the shit out of everything. The, the whole suspension system is going to get a ton of stress uh, when that happens. So that's how the, motor sp- uh, the, the car industry fixes that. It is a real problem. And uh, you want to avoid it at all costs. If you've ever seen a Civic bang down really low, just jumping down the road, that he took out his bump stops. Or he's riding fully on the... He lowered the spring so far that the bump stop becomes the spring. And that, like the weight of the car will compress a bump stop almost all the way to the point where it's fully compressed... So at that point, you've got this like huge spring rate, and you've, you've only got this tiny little amount of travel. So every little bump it hits, the, the car's going to jump up in the air. And it bends wheels. Yeah, good call. Uh, lost Johnny. Yeah, all kinds of horrible things happen when you hit infinite spring rate. Uh, just clicked the soldering iron on. I pronounce it like that for fun. Not because... I am British, or Blitish. Uh, nice. Oh, John Larson brings up an excellent point. Uh, the other reason I run, that I forgot to mention, the other reason I run the white ones is if it gets really cold, the white ones are going to maintain their softness better than the harder ones. Um, so there's also that. All right, let's desolder some wires. So I guess, yeah, I'll desolder them from the ESC. It's interesting when you have uh, when you have race wires, you have some options, right? I could technically desolder them from here, but these wires are already the perfect length, so kind of no reason to not desolder from the uh, the ESC itself, ESC pads, I should say. Uh, time check, 5.54. Okay, so we got six more minutes. Let's see if we can get this ESC out of here in the next six minutes. That'll be a cool little challenge. 
challenges. That'd be interesting. What kind of challenges could we do on here? I mean, building really fast is an easy one. Um, I don't love that one. Now, nah, you know what? Fuck challenges, because then it gets all competitive. F competitiveness. And I just bridge these two, which makes no difference, because it's blown up anyway. Uh, the only thing I really care about right now, like the only thing my brain is going through right now, is not to flick a ball of solder onto the flight controller. Um, the ESC is shot. So the only bad thing that could happen is for me to ruin something else that's not blown up. Just to give you guys a little window into how my brain works. Because my brain never shuts off. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons why mental illness is becoming so prevalent. Uh, I actually just maybe yesterday heard um, whatever the what is it? Generation Z? Whatever the most recent generation is. I think it's Generation Z. Um, the, the rate at which they're having mental illness problems is like unheard of. And uh, they're actually being called now the, like the mental illness or like the anxiety generation or like basically the mental illness generation. Um, and my opinion is that we... Oh, I looked it up the other day. I looked up the other day how long Homo sapiens have been uh, oh, yeah. on the Earth. What was it, 6,000 BC or something? You thought that, but it was like 200,000 or something. Yeah, that's right. It was, a, it was a huge amount of time. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, right? So, for that amount of time, our species, I guess, I would have to say, to be fully correct... Um, our species has evolved. I don't care if you don't believe in evolution. It is real. Um, we have evolved to a certain amount of things going on, right? Things to make our brains work. At first, it was probably pretty minimal, right? Uh, grunting and killing things for food. Uh, and... As civilization moved forward, we started to fill our brains up with more stuff, right? Um, radio, language, uh, talking to other Homo sapiens. And in... So, you know, the, the Dark Ages, right? That stuff starts to happen. Uh, but in the last hundred years... It's just gone off the reservation, right? Like, a hundred years ago, there was no internet. It was still pretty simple and basic. Um, but in the last hundred years, that has changed a lot. And I think, it's just a random kind of thought, just thinking about shit one day, I think that the human brain needs to evolve into that. And evolution doesn't take hundreds of years. It takes tens of thousands of years um although i guess not I, I guess not that much time some we, we do see some evolution happen quicker than that um but evolution takes a long time two minutes two minutes two minutes so that's my thought on that that's the only thing that really makes sense as to why mental illness has exploded um although no the, the other possibility would be that it's always been there it just hasn't been diagnosed uh that is a very real possibility but i think it has more to do with the fact that our brains were not designed to have a screen in front of them uh screaming at them all day every day and uh we have become really good at marketing right as as like a civilization marketing is like a huge thing and marketing is based upon like just nailing you with info right so you can buy the thing and uh yeah i think that look at that we got it done one minute to spare um i think that has something to do with it so the esc is out and uh maybe tomorrow night we will put the gs25 in but i'm done right now my voice is going to hell uh i want to go build a uh, christmas tree
Uh, Supercell says Stingy's doing a live stream flying. Is he really? Uh, everybody go check out Kevin's stream. I uh, wish I'd gotten an invite, but that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, wait. The camera's over here. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? I, I tried to like change the, um, the scene. I wanted to change the scene on OBS to get myself back on. Uh, but there was no scene because I'd moved the camera. You guys are awesome as always. Uh, hit the Patreon. Lots of good shit in there. Uh, lots of cool people. Um, Seattle FPV on Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube. If you click the bell on these streams, you'll get a notification when I stream. Sometimes I stream at random in the middle of the week. Uh, uh, affiliate links are down there as well. Doesn't do it's simple and it puts more money into the FPV bank of stuff to uh, break <laughs> and test. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Tomorrow night at ten o'clock Eastern time. I'll be back, and I don't know what we'll be doing. Definitely a pilot spotlight. Oh, giveaways. We'll do giveaways, pilot spotlight, and I can all but guarantee I won't be able to get this put back together, but that's fine. Uh, and then, so the 12 days of Ciati kind of went off the rails a couple days ago, uh, but I, I, I think I put out some, some really decent content for you guys. I'm going to try to maybe get another edit done tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but the long and short of it is I'm trying really hard to just bombard content right now. This channel has gone from 1,000 subs to 2,000 subs in almost less than a month. Um, almost less than a month. That's a weird thing to say. Uh, it happened very, very quickly. Uh, so I just want to keep it going. And I have ass loads of old footage, um, even recent footage, uh, that I haven't done edits on. So I'm trying really hard to, to devote as much time as I can to doing edits, but there's a lot to juggle. Um, I, I'm, I'm just being as mindful as I can to, to not do too much and ruin it all. So you guys are a huge help. I, I mean, I know it telling somebody like, Hey, thanks for all you do. Like, I, I know it seems like they would just blow you off. I, I don't know if other people do or not. My, I suspect they don't. Uh, all I can speak to is from my experience it is really really cool and it really does help uh on the bad days to just get it going a little bit so thank you you guys are awesome uh this little part of the community that that we are in is very special um it two and a half years ago when i first got into it into this hobby it wasn't as mainstream uh and now that it's gone mainstream we've gotten well mainstream ish right we've gotten some of the bad things that come with mainstream and basically just shit people um but this little group that we've got really really cool um and that's because of you guys so love it go fly get you a tiny brushless setup see you guys tomorrow at 10 Laters.